morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 455 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Shoo-doop, 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 bad hi, yeah. I am your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey. And not with me today is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. However, with me is, of course, my boss and my supervisor, Alistair McBear. Performance review time again. So he'll be monitoring and supervising. What's that? Yes, I know. We have to have some bear in some way, one way or the other. Uh, Now, Mr. Grizzly is not with us this morning because uh, primarily um, we were uh, up until about two something in the morning uh, yesterday. Uh, As you know, here in Ottawa, it is Capital Pride weekend. And uh, we had our monthly podcast on the weekend. Thank you to everyone who has joined. And uh, yesterday we got together for a little barbecue uh, during which I got to meet James DeFiori for the very first time in person. Um, the meeting as was as wonderful as anyone would expect. Very nice man. Um, you know, like we had, uh, uh, like we had always known each other. So uh, it was a wonderful time in that regard. Um, we had very, very juicy steaks that were excellently cook at, cooked at or barbecued, I should say, at Mademoiselle Fox's residence. Um, there were a couple of bottles of wine, and by couple, I mean probably at least three <laughs> that were opened. Uh, and uh, we um, chatted and whatnot well into the evening and the night, and uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Grizzly got to bed at around 2 o'clock in the morning. I got home a little after 2 o'clock in the morning and had a little bit of adrenaline, and I got to bed around 3. So it's been a very short night. Uh, So Mr. Grizzly is probably still hibernating. So, um, you have me solo today. <laughs> a big thank you goes to our founding sponsors, the Peppermaster, the Miss B Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Hopefully, I see some uh, kits here. Yeah, okay, I see them in the chat, so I'm guessing that uh, people do hear me. So, um, since we are saying hello to people, why not? Uh, good morning. Kit Argosi Akers, how are you today? Good morning, Kit Elaine. How are you, my dear? Good morning, Kit Cassie. Nice to see you. It's always lovely to see you on the chat. Let's see who else do we have with us? Kit Tabby G, Kit Mohan. Hello, Mohan and family. 
I hope everyone is doing well there. Um, hmm, interesting things. Every time I click on your name, something appears above you. Uh, Kit Tom, hello. Kit Linda M. Uh, Kit Linda M, who says, the Vancouver Aquarium has a sea otter pup cam on their YouTube channel. Ooh, I need to go check that out because I do love otters very much. Kit Carol, hello, Nona. Nice to see you, Kit Swanky Frankie. Yes, I did it. Um, by the way, Kits and Cubs, I am producing this show solo from the phone today. Uh, so this is a completely new experience because all the buttons are in different places. So um, I will appreciate your patience with a bit of a choppy show, <laughs> if that is going to be the case today. Uh, see, okay, Dan, hello. <laughs> I blame Trudeau. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everything's the dude's fault. I know, I know. Uh, the screen is different. Yes, uh, the screen for some reason is vertical uh, rather than horizontal. I'm going to see if I can find a way to alter that uh, eventually. Kits and Cubs. Uh, so uh, please be patient with me, but I, I know that there is a button for that, so I will uh, look. Um, we have Kit Aaron who has joined us today. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, interesting message. All right. Uh, but yeah, if that's your thing, good on you. Uh, Kit Saucy, I don't like this. <laughs> Neither do I. Oh, thank you for the compliment about my shirt. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Party Beaver. <laughs> yes, it was a party. Uh, we have a Kit Forest, which is a new name for us. Hi. Good morning to you. Hope everything is doing well. Uh, this is taking a little longer because I have to scroll with my finger uh, all the way up on the phone, which is kind of interesting. Uh, rather than having to use keyboards. Uh, we have Kit Winchester Wizard, which is a new name for us. Good morning to you. Good morning, Crazy Cheech. Lovely to see you again. Nona, Nona herself. Bonjour, bonjour. Ah, and good, oh, handsome. See, thank you. Thank you very much. What a very, very kind compliment. Uh, this guy, 87, um, has a really interesting request asking if I can turn off my mic. Well, if I do that, then it's going to make it hard to do a show. And so I'm sorry, but we cannot accommodate your request this morning. You might have to turn off your speaker then. All right. Uh, who else do we have? Um, I just like to help. So just a helpful tip. Uh, Miss Shadika, lovely to see you too. Pumpkin Spice Vibes <laughs> with my shirt says Kit Tavi G. Uh, and okay, if there are more of you, uh, kits and cubs. Um, I cannot unfortunately uh, see you. So uh, hopefully I've got you in real time right now. Yes, that's what it, that's what it appears to be. All right. Uh, let me see if I can. There we go. This might change. Well, okay. That's different. Let's try this. Hmm. All right. Uh, it does not seem to be working, Kits and Cubs, in order to change. I see the buttons that tell me how I can change the screen, but it seems that if I'm doing it on the phone, it is going to leave me in vertical rather than uh, horizontal. So, um, yeah, it seems that uh, it is not going to be an option. I'll try other buttons. Nope. Nope. No. Sorry, Kits and Cubs. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to uh, have me in a vertical for today. I apologize. All right, Kits and Cubs. Um, a little bit of stuff in the news. A relatively light day uh, and relatively light weekend. Um, for those of you who are members, you may have noticed that Mr. Grizzly has started something called a Grizzly Growl, which is exclusive content on our YouTube page. Uh, I will probably, which are short little rants, uh, or uh, uh, maybe not rants all the time. Uh, this time it was, uh, but just more shorter little messages about a certain topic. Um, I will probably have mine. I had experimented a couple of times uh, over the past few months with uh, something I'm 
referring to as beaver tails. So uh, you'll probably get some type of content like that. So, you know, two to five minute clips or something with uh, us uh, talking about one uh, topic uh, specifically and giving a more succinct position. Um, so if you are one of our uh, members here on YouTube, and if you've gotten a membership, uh, you can look forward to content like that being added because you need to get something if you're going to subscribe to membership. Uh, for those who are listening on YouTube, I think it is because we have passed 5,000 subscribers. We now have the opportunity for memberships, and there are three different tiers. So you can support us monthly in that way and uh, get access to our regular show and uh, some bonus content as well that we will be providing for you there. So, all right, on with the show. It seems that uh, the big news, well, Mr. Grizzly's uh, growl, by the way, was about uh, Pierre Poitiev um, seemingly uh, putting out another tweet with regard to the 85th anniversary, I think it was, of um, something to do. Um, actually, you know what? I don't, I don't actually know off the top of my head what it was uh, about officially. Can't remember. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Uh, had to do with uh, socialism and uh, that thing that because the Nazi party called itself uh, socialist was in the name, there's a lot of people that uh, go to Twitter and uh, or social media and uh, particularly the you know people who peddle in disinformation and misinformation who try to basically make some type of comment such that, well, because they used the word socialist in their name, that they actually truly were socialists, and that uh, socialism and Nazism are pretty much one and the same. That requires a very interesting twist on history. Uh, requires a certain amount of, uh, it takes place in a certain form of revisionism, uh, because we know that Pierre Poliev, while well, his thing is to kind of uh, twist absolutely everything whatsoever to try and make a case uh, against socialism, because allegedly the liberals are socialist. Uh, if you ask any NDP voter what they think about that, uh, they'll probably laugh you out of the room, because uh, clearly, in their view, uh, not socialist enough. And it's not like the New Democrats are full-blown socialists or, you know, typically more social democratic than anything else. But, uh, yes, uh, he made this comment, and I'm looking for it right now. Here we go. On the 85th anniversary of Black Ribbon Day, we remember the victims of Soviet socialism and National Socialism Nazism. May we never forget the countless atrocities committed by these socialist, socialist ideologies, and may we honor those who fought to liberate Europe. Canada must always stand against socialism for freedom and democracy. And then you see him getting ratioed. For the last time, the Nazis were capitalists. Jesus Christ, you're a moron. Uh, I don't think that that word means what you think it means. That little scene, I believe it is from The, the Prince's Bride. Um, and there was a um, professor of history who uh, had commented on that. I believe his name was Tom Chapman, and uh, hopefully I can find that as well. But uh, basically, Pierre Polyev got ratioed pretty darn hard with this, which kind of makes me wonder, you know, if good things come in threes, as they say, well, we have Pierre, who needed to delete his Bring Home Home Fever Dream video, which was kind of embarrassing because uh, that went international and viral. I mean, it was uh, stories about it in The Guardian. There were stories about it on CNN. Um, however, where there weren't very many stories about it, there was a little bit, but not very many, was in the Canadian media for some reason, uh, they didn't think that it was a story, ironically enough. 
Hmm. Don't know why that is the case, but uh, it seems like pretty big. Uh, this too seems to be a non-story. It doesn't seem that any media noticed what he tried to do with this, tried to explore, exploit basically the deaths of all those people way back when for a political purpose today by essentially lying about the whole general context behind why it is that uh, they died. Um, we have a gentleman uh, that goes by Chris Chuckery on uh, Twitter. who says, Black Ribbon Day is the European day of remembrance for victims of Stalinism and Nazism. Never one to waste cheapening a solemn event with hack partisanship. Pierre Polyev continues to spout a false equivalency. It is because Nazi economic policies are closer to those of modern conservatism with their opposition to labor unions and encouragement of pearl sorry encouragement of cartels and monopolies i can hear the clutching of pearls at this comparison we are all born ignorant but one must work hard to remain so so is pp ignorant or a fear-mongering rage farmer at any rate he is lying again so that was from uh, chuck uh, chris chuckry um and then uh, hopefully I will, there we go, Tom Chapman. As a Holocaust educator, I can confirm you couldn't be more wrong. Communists and socialists were the first groups rounded up by the Nazis and hauled off to concentration camps. I'm told that you're a Canadian member of parliament. How embarrassing for you. Wow. And that was a, as a response to uh, Pierre doubling down uh, with, Woke left goes crazy when people point out the undeniable historical fact that National Socialists in Germany and Italy were, as the name proves, socialists. Fascism, socialism, communism glorifies the state over people and always with the same horrific result. Um, first, they came for the trade unionists. He apparently forgot that uh, little bit. So, yeah, as uh, Pierre Polyev tries to rewrite history, uh, to basically uh, shoehorn everything into socialism is bad and liberals are socialists. Therefore, liberals are bad and uh, bad to the point of, uh, you know, being Nazi-like. When he and the members of his party are the people that showed up at events transpiring in Ottawa where people showed up with Nazi insignia and. Uh, the people they chose to support didn't know better than to tell these people to go home. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a kind of disappointing that he would uh, go that route, but not surprising. So if good things come in threes, the bring home home video got deleted. And then a couple of days ago, Michelle Ferreri made a claim that parents were trafficking their children because, well, the carbon tax had gotten so high and now um, they're sort of poor. Um, never mind that uh, the price of gas has uh, decreased by way much more than the increase in carbon regulatory pricing since April, but right, uh, making it such that uh, even with the uptick in carbon regulatory pricing, the price of gas is actually lower per liter now than it was before the latest increase in carbon pricing. But we, we won't say that. And never mind that uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada said that carbon pricing contributes about 0.15% to the price um, or to inflation. So, um, yeah, that's hardly uh, the difference between you just having enough money to pay your rent or eat uh, to keep the lights on or take your medication, uh, even if you kill the carbon tax. Uh, and that's the thing I'm wondering about uh, the conservatives. Let's say they get into power and they kill the carbon tax and people realize, uh, yeah, that allows them to buy uh, one more egg out of $10. Ooh, living the high life now. Uh, then what? What's the solution? Who's he going to blame now? So uh, it's a bit of a bait and switch. If you are um, informed, if you're media literate, if you're politically literate, you understand this. You get this, uh, that he is lying to you like 
crazy. So if uh, good things come in threes, uh, maybe this tweet of his um, giving a totally and inaccurate spin on history uh, will be the next one to go. You never know. And uh, probably like the other ones, uh, they will make them disappear after everybody's seen them, everybody's ratioed them, everybody's screen capped them or saved them somehow, and uh, just kind of pretend that it never existed, even though we all saw it. See, when the conservatives do this, if they need to retract a tweet, you would think that if they retracted a tweet, right, they would also say, hey, everyone, um, we screwed up, so we retract this. But apparently, uh, that's not what they do, is uh, they just delete the tweets and then say nothing about it to uh, not draw any more attention to the fact they screwed up and hope that nobody will ask them questions about it. That's pretty much what they are uh, what they are known for. That's the, that's the playbook that they use. But, hey, right? Um, kids and Cubs? Uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, not that I noticed that everything's going on, but uh, but I noticed that we have some uh, names uh, that I do not recognize in the chat. Um, we have some basic house rules, and you're all respecting them. Uh, so, but just want to make them clear. Um, everybody in the chat here is uh, good people. We assume uh, and of good intent, so uh, we do not first assume the worst of each other. Uh, we can have different opinions so long as they are respectfully um, expressed. Uh, we don't insult each other if possible. Uh, <laughs> really appreciate if we don't do that. Uh, but we also try to make sure that uh, the content that we post is actually factually correct and that any logic that is used in arguing, arguing different points is actually sound logic. Um, because uh, we have a chat, I call them the best damn family of podcasting, and they are pretty informed people. So if someone is trying to peddle some disinformation and whatnot, um, you will be countered. So just to let you know, uh, hopefully politely, uh, but uh, we do have a well-informed audience who's seeking to be informed and uh, likes the fact that there is a little space on the internet uh, where we're facts first and we don't take flights of logic and we don't try to twist and torque things in order to fit a narrative. And, you know, so uh, the question, uh, if you don't understand what somebody says, what did you mean by that? Perfectly valid question. And our kids, our, our audience are perfectly willing to explain uh, what's behind their thinking. Uh, so we can have differences of opinions. All right. That's not a problem. They actually are welcome here. We love uh, stimulating debate and conversation in the chat as well as part of our show. Um, but uh, for uh, people that have been at other places where people are quick to jump down people's throats and not be kind, that's not the vibe we go for here. Go for here. So uh, you don't have to start a conversation with your backup. Um, this is a fun and a welcoming place. And so long as the conversations, like I said, are respectful and actually fact-based, everything will be fine. So uh, we try to work very hard to create this little corner. And we hope that uh, if you've just found us, uh, that you will keep coming back and that you will enjoy uh, the vibe that we try to create here. All right? So again, not saying anybody's doing anything wrong this morning, but I figured uh, after uh, a few incidents that we've had over the last couple of weeks, and we've had some people that have figured it out, you know, that over here you can uh, you can uh, speak freely about uh, different types of things. Um, you know, like this, and you will have vigorous debate if people don't agree, um, but it's not personal. We hug it out at the end of every show. All right. <laughs> so just so you know how it works over here, I figured it would probably be a better idea to say it more proactively. Uh, on the show as we are growing and people are finding us that uh, sometimes um, people just don't know the culture of our show and the culture of our chat. I figured I would share it with you. All right. Oh, for Savage. Interesting comment. My entire family is from Canada. I'm the only one who lives in the USA and I'm moving back to Canada because that's where everyone I love lives. I understand the importance of understanding both sides. What a 
beautiful comment. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, if uh, I may be so bold uh, to ask, um, where are you in uh, the United States? Be nice so if you would share that with us. We would love to, but uh, thank you so much for joining us for the show. We really, really, really appreciate it. I, I wish there was a way that I can scroll through your comments without them being covered every time I <laughs> push the push something on the screen. Ah, I see that Kit James has uh, joined us in the, the chat, and uh, I believe the comment is so hung over. <laughs> I came, and that's not the one. There we go. That's what I'm showing. Yeah, that will happen when we uh, go through a couple of beers and then a couple of bottles of wine and then some Caesars and then something else afterwards. <laughs> um, Kits and Cubs, yesterday I... Uh, I'm not a big drinker, and I think yesterday and the day before uh, hanging around with my friends, I consumed more alcohol in two days than I did in the last four months. Yeah. <laughs> but everything in moderation, including moderation. All right. So today in the news, Kits and Cubs, like I said, relatively slow weekend news wise um but something that is going on which is pretty oh kit for savage says he's from augusta maine hey i love maine it's a really great place really really good people there um so yeah but uh if you're coming back to canada welcome back uh we always love we always love it when people come back we know it's a big world and you go out and explore but when you come back home we are waiting for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the big news will be is that uh, the Liberal Cabinet is meeting for a retreat in Halifax. I'm assuming that there are going to be some extremely frank conversations happening behind closed doors. And that, how would you say, uh, there will be a public facade that will be maintained uh, in public communications to show that, how would I say, uh, that everybody is on the same team and rowing in the same direction. But I think it would be normal. There, there's a whole ner Nervous Nellies component to politics. But at this point, uh, we're closing in on the one year until the election. And... The summer so far in polling hasn't really shown a bounce for the liberals after doing the whole barbecue, flip pancakes, press the flesh tour. Um, it does show, Ecos polling specifically, has shown a big drop in conservative support. Um, now, Ecos had some polling that was showing them about 25 points up, which seems a little uh, ridiculously high. Uh, and it says that they've dropped from 25 points up to only 14 points up, which is still a lot. Um, but it seems that there might be an effect of what's going on in the United States with uh, when you compare both the Republican and the Democratic conventions. Everything that happens in the United States seems to trickle up here by osmosis. So all the negative uh, when, you know, when Bush too was the president, uh, then we went and elected ourselves a Harper. And, you know, both of them were similar in the fact that uh, they've never met a war somewhere in the world that they weren't willing to get us involved in, for example. Uh, and then uh, the Trump thing happened. And, uh, well, now we've got PP who is trying to do his version of it. Um, and now that things have taken a little bit of a twist on the United States side, with regard to um, President Joe Biden taking a step aside to make room for Kamala Harris and to Tim Walz, that uh, the mood has changed a little bit from everything being dour and sad and angry and a statement on how our respective countries are broken or shitholes and. Uh, that uh, we need one person to come along and save us, to give us our freedom back, or someone who's convinced that they alone can do it when really they can't do much um, and haven't showed um, much of a proficiency 
at getting things done, at least getting things done well and within the bounds of the law. If you know what I mean. So, some people are wondering, a lot of people are hoping that the hope and joy narrative that the Democrats are putting out there, and there have been some. Uh, there's some magazine articles, there's one or newspaper articles that uh, pointed out saying, joy is not a strategy. Um, yeah, actually it is. On the show, we talk often about uh, the battle between tone and countertone. And if the tone being chosen by the opposition is everything's terrible, everything's worst, doom, doom, doom. I hate these people. I hate these people. You need to blame all these people for all your problems. Hate on them, hate on them, hate on them, hate on them. Um, then the counter narrative, the counter tone of joy and happiness hey, you can be happy warriors and politics doesn't have to be this. Um, it is a strategy, actually. It can't be the only strategy. There's got to be more to it. But it 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 is a strategy. So, um, there's some talk that maybe Canadians are ready for that as well. With the current prime minister, the prime minister came in, for example, on sunny ways. Now, a lot of people are going, oh, so much about the sunny ways, so much about the sunny ways. Well, I mean, uh, the sunny ways couldn't be a nine-year thing all the time. I mean, we did get four years of Trump and about three and a half years of COVID. They were hardly sunny times. They did require us to adopt a different disposition. But now that Trump is gone as POTUS, and it seemed that we were getting him again, and maybe he looks more like he will remain gone as POTUS. And as we are moving further and further away from the worst of COVID, it is not over, kids and cubs. There will be a new uh, booster formulation of the booster coming up being available relatively soon please get this one if you haven't got one in a while there wasn't necessarily a recommendation to get the last one at the beginning of the spring because it wasn't a new formulation if you didn't really need it or you know if you had a lifestyle that was a uh, not as social in terms of interacting with other people but uh, this new uh, formulation that will be coming up sometime this fall um I, I've tried to look into how how long it will be before it does come, but it is coming. I'm, I'm sure it won't be all that long because uh, I was kind of hoping that it would be ready before back to school, to be totally honest, because that's when uh, people start to mingling again. And everybody's been away and brings whatever they picked up elsewhere back. But when this one comes, do make a point to get it if you're the type of person that wants to stay up on your boosters and be a, have the most recent uh, protection that there is. Um, there are some uh, situations here in Canada, um, particularly in the Montreal area, I believe, where um, COVID cases has uh, shot up uh, pretty substantially, actually, and hospitalizations has have as well. Uh, and this, of course, if you happen to be living on, in Ontario, happens to be happening at a time where the government of Ontario has decided that, uh, nah, we don't need any wastewater data anymore, which um, is not true, actually. We do need it. It could be very, very helpful, again, particularly for those who live in long-term care centers because with wastewater data, you can actually look into certain neighborhoods specifically. Um, so, um, yeah, according here to uh, Global News, they say significant amount of COVID expected in the fall are new vaccines coming. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you, kids and cubs. As the World Health Organization warns about a worrying comeback of COVID-19 among a summer surge of infections, new vaccines may soon come to Canada this fall. Health Canada told Global News it is reviewing submissions from Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax for their updated COVID-19 shots targeting the most recent strains circulating and will approve them if they are deemed safe and effective. Quote, Health Canada will authorize the vaccines if, following a thorough and independent scientific review of the evidence, we determine that the vaccines meet safety, quality, and efficacy standards, Nicholas jean a spokesperson for the agency, said in an email Tuesday. Starting in the fall of 2024, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, 
strongly recommends the most recently updated COVID-19 vaccines for previously vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals at increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection or severe COVID-19 and illness. These include everyone aged 65 or older, long-term care home residents, pregnant people, those with underlying medical conditions, and people from indigenous communities. Quote, Receiving the most recently updated COVID-19 vaccine is expected to provide a better immune response against circulating COVID-19 strains compared to earlier vaccines and is especially important for those at increased risk of COVID-19 infection or severe COVID-19 illness, Jean Vaux said. The latest Canadian wastewater data as of Tuesday shows a moderate viral activity level of COVID-19 in the country, but that could change in the coming months as schools reopen and weather gets cooler, experts say. Quote, I think from what we've seen, we are expecting there is going to be a significant amount of COVID in the fall and winter, Alison McGear, an infectious disease physician at Sinai Health in Toronto, said in an interview with Global News. And if you're a Canadian citizen, then you can probably also expect that not necessarily everybody uh, has been getting uh, boosters past, like, you know, uh, the second or the third shot or fourth shot, let's say. Uh, people's uh, not not compliance, but uh, feeling the need that they need to go get them has decreased with time. So there may be more people in the general public uh, for whom it's been um, a more, let's say, more than a year amount of time since they've gotten their last vaccine. So um, their immunity is probably lower and therefore might be more susceptible to catch something now they already have the initial ones so that will offer some some protection of some kind um because it, it, you know it doesn't always completely go away um but given that in the population there are more people that are probably further away from their last uh, booster their last b dose uh, that's maybe one of the reasons that people uh or experts or authorities are expecting that the, this winter, uh, this coming fall, might have a more significant uh, way, uh, a significant amount of uh, COVID uh, coming up. So just keep your eyes wide open on this. McGear said, quote, COVID is still a concern in Canada. People should get vaccinated. There's still very clearly, there's still very clearly a benefit to getting your shot when they're available in Canada to protect you through the winter. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the virus has constantly changed and mutated into different variants, keeping vaccine makers on their toes to update their shots. So the KP3 variant is the one that's dominating in Canada right now, accounting for the majority of the cases. KP3 is a genetic cousin of KP1 and KP2, which are playfully dubbed the flirt variants. I missed that when that happened. I do not know why they call it that. These originate from JN1, the Omicron subvariant that fueled the winter surge. Uh, last winter so there you go um and uh for example if you are in quebec here uh it says that uh this is from august 23rd masking returns to laval hospitals as covid 19 cases increase across quebec um this is another thing that you might want to do kids and cubs if you are riding public transit or if you happen to be taking uh, intercity trains or intercity buses it may be time um again for the period as we get ready to go back to school and maybe two, uh, two or three weeks after until we see how uh, different the situation is going to be. Um, just as an extra layer of protection, you might want to get your masks ready for that. But according to the CBC, the regional health board overseeing Laval, north of Montreal, reintroduced masking across its facilities on Friday in response to an increase in cases of COVID-19 among employees and the city's population as a whole. In an internal memo sent to staff and viewed by CBC News, the CISSS de Laval called on workers to wear a procedural mask when in direct contact with patients. The COVID-19 positivity rate in Laval increased from 2.9% in mid-April to 27% in august so nearly a tenfold increase that is a lot by any standards the rest of quebec is also experiencing a spike in covid 19 outbreaks with hospitalizations doubling between mid-june and mid-august according to data from the l'institut national de santé publique 
Hospitalizations are at their highest level since last winter with more than 1,200 people with COVID-19 in Quebec hospitals. In recent weeks, more than 30 people have died from the virus every week. And I believe that today is the first day of classes in Quebec. So um, there might be more here. Um, in an email to CBC News, the Quebec Health Ministry said it is, quote, the prerogative of establishments to put in place the measures necessary and relevant to the situation in the field. Facilities can now determine which situations require masks to be worn, it said. Dr. Donald Vin, an infectious disease specialist from the McGill University Health Center, lauded the Laval Health Board's decision to make masking uh, with, yeah, sorry, to make masking when in contact with patients mandatory. Quote, when a patient seeks medical attention, they go with a specific medical problem, and what they do not want is to pick up an additional problem, he said, adding that masking also protects healthcare professionals. Quote, we're already short-staffed for a variety of reasons in most, most healthcare settings. The uh, INSPQ, so the, um, sorry, I have to go find the name again because l'Institut National de Santé Publique, there we go. Says there are 110 outbreaks in long-term care facilities and 54 healthcare centers. Over 21% of tests for COVID-19 in the province are positive, the highest rate since last December. Uh, yeah, a test positivity rate of 20% or more is it, 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 that's very high. It's very high. It's, you know, one in five tests are coming back positive. And since we're not testing everybody, we're testing people that we believe might be more likely or most likely to be showing those signs and of those ones, one out of five. But that's a lot. Considering the number of people one person can infect, one out of five is a lot. Experts say the virus has not yet adopted the same seasonal pattern as cold and flu viruses, both of which are more prevalent in winter. Quote, COVID doesn't have any seasonality, Vin said. It's not the same variant that persists throughout the year because it can continue to propagate throughout the year. You get the development of new variants. In late July, Quebec's Immunization Committee released the recommendations on administering vaccine this fall. People aged 60 and over and immunocompromised people are encouraged to get a booster dose before the fall. It's important that they get maximum protection as quickly as possible, said Dr. Cécile Tremblay, a microbiologist and infectious disease specialist at the Shum Hospital in Montreal. With the circulation of new variants, the committee recommends that people under 16 under 60, wait for the next version of the vaccine as the mRNA vaccine is no longer favored. Quote, if it's less urgent, it's more interesting to have a vaccine that matches the strains currently circulating in Quebec, said Dr. Tremblay. So if you are living in Quebec and you are in these at-risk groups, it might be advisable for you to get a booster now, even if it's with the older version, than to wait, uh, given the rate at which it is circulating uh, in the rest of Canada. Uh, things are such that you can probably still wait at the moment. Uh, but I said when back to school starts in the rest of Canada just after Labor Day, um, the first three weeks after back to school is uh, if there's going to be uh, the beginning of a fall spike is where you're going to start uh, noticing it. So probably uh, within the first uh, three weeks and around the three week mark, three week mark, uh, you'll get uh, the best impression. Uh, well, might be at its peak unless. Uh, there are a lot of people, and then you hit a little tipping point where you have a surge that goes a little higher, needs a more sustained effort to get it down. So just keep your eyes open, please, kids and cubs, as I mentioned often on the show. Um, I'm trying not to do it as a um, moralizing thing, um, but more as a I love the members of the damn fam, and I would love to keep you all with me for as long as possible. So in order to do that, well then, I hope that you don't take ill and that nothing bad happens to you. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And pretty much anybody I know who has had COVID since this has started has uh, said that it has not been an enjoyable experience at all. So if you can uh, prevent that for yourself, I would really, really, really like that to be the case for you, kids and cubs. There we go. Uh, I see that there was one person here that was uh, just here to uh, in the chat to shout pro-Trump stuff. So kids and cubs, I do believe that I have taken care of that person. Um, 
just shouting Trump stuff doesn't add anything to the conversation. First of all, wrong country. Number two, probably not the audience that's going to be most receptive to that. Totally honest. We're nonpartisan, but we do sit somewhere on the political set spectrum. And if you're like really, really, really extreme left or really, really extreme right, you're probably hate watching us more than love watching us. But, you know, we still are facts first and sound logic, so you can still get something out of the show. But you're probably not going to like what we're going to say. So uh, if you're anywhere else, you know, left, right, middle, within, you know, a um, team normal <laughs> perspective on our other side, you probably will find something on the show that you like somewhere where that will speak to you if you, you stick around long enough. So that's the COVID stuff. Um, getting back to the cabinet retreat, I kind of, kind of took a long detour to get there. But uh, according to, I believe this would be Canadian press, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will kick off a three-day cabinet retreat in Halifax on Sunday. So that happens yesterday, where the themes are fairness and Canada-U.S. relations, but the feelings are all about deja vu. A year ago in Charlottetown, the cabinet hoped its annual post-summer retreat and massive cabinet sub shuffle that preceded it would give new life to the Liberal government. Spoiler alert, they did not. Trudeau and his team are so far behind the Conservatives in the polls that if they were on a running track, they'd have been lapped by now. And with the next election, at most a year away, the runway to recover is growing shorter by the day. Interest rates have started to come down. Inflation is back in a normal range. Wage growth has been strong. But housing costs and availability remain extremely challenging. Food prices are still high. And the Liberals have been unable to counter messaging from Conservative leader Pierre Poliev that life has become more expensive and unsafe under Trudeau's watch. In June, the Liberals lost a long-held Toronto seat to Conservatives, further eroding what was left of the fragile confidence the party had that they could stage a miraculous comeback with Trudeau still at the hem helm. And uh, as we mentioned often on the show, we have two more by-elections coming up, one in uh, Elmwood, Transcona in Manitoba, and the other one in uh, La salle ville mar verdun in uh, Quebec. And um, the latter one is considered a liberal stronghold, uh, but there seems to be a lot of competition for it. And if the liberals were to lose that one, uh, that would be one more on the pile of, oh my God, things are disastrous under Trudeau. When is he going? Um, and that one, uh, if he does, uh, if the Liberals do lose that one, that one could lead uh, to him having to go. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on the benches yet uh, who is willing to take over uh, well enough uh, to counter Pierre. Uh, I know for a fact, and I think we can all know for a fact, that no matter if the Trudeau were to go, no matter who it would be, um, all the things that they said about Trudeau, they'll just say about them too. Right? Uh, there's also been some word on the street that uh, somebody uh, might be looking to cause some trouble for Christian Freeland. We saw that with the, the Black Ribbon Day, that there are some people that seem uh, to want Christian Freeland, um, there's talk, and uh, this is a long, long-running talk, that there might have been someone in Christian Freeland's, Freeland's family back in the day um, who was more associated with Nazism. She's not, very clearly, right? Uh, and it seems that whenever she talks about it, there's some people that get mad and say, well, you didn't mention the relative in your family specifically. Well, it's like, well, I mean... I'm assuming here, kids and cubs, that if she is denouncing Nazism and she is not specifically going out of her way to say everybody except this member from my family, yes, then she's also including the member of her family, right? The ancestor in her family. And that there's no specific need for her to say, to make a special case of saying all Nazis, including some who may have been part of my family way back when. So, so it, it seems that some people are not happy unless she takes that extra step, um, which would just be performative. You know, if she's not making a point to make an exception for certain people, then I think we can safely assume that uh, they are included. 
All right. So, so just to let you know that that's uh, that's we, that they'll be in the works. Um, it's an old thing that they keep on coming up with, and they've tried to make stick for a long time. But um, yeah, yeah, they'll do what they will do. Right. Um, in June, uh, let's see what it said. The cabinet met briefly over the summer to sign off on some appointments, but the working dinner that kicks off the retreat on Sunday will mark the first in piercing meeting since that by-election. Mark Circus, the chief strategy officer at the Compass Rose government relations firm and former senior liberal staffer said most cabinet retreats are 90% focused on the business of government and 10% on politics and caucus management. This time, she said, there may be more focus on the latter, especially in the more informal conversations on the sidelines. I think what's on the agenda at this retreat is probably even less important than simply having it be a moment to convene, she said. This government, quote, desperately needs a reset, she said, but that may be as much about being better able to respond to the constant changes happening in the world and in Canada, rather than trying to game out every step of the next six to 12 months before the vote. Quote, I think the reality for this retreat is that in some respects, it's less about the agenda and the programming as it is being able to have some real frank conversations about where they all stand and whether they have the energy, the muster, the ideas and the drive to keep going, said Circus. The cabinet shuffle in July 2023 saw seven ministers dropped completely and seven new faces added while 22 of the remaining 30 ministers moved into different roles. Only minor changes have been made since, and Trudeau has thus far chosen not to shuffle the cabinet again before this fall. Circus noted that some of the fallout from the 2023 shuffle is still being felt. Both the Toronto-St. Paul's by-election, which the Liberals lost in June, and the upcoming by-elections in Montreal's La Salle et Ma writing, came after former ministers who lost their portfolios, Carolyn Bennett and David Lametti, chose to exit politics altogether. Bennett's seat in Toronto was lost to the Conservatives after being a Liberal stronghold for nearly 30 years, and Lametti is in danger of being taken by the NDP when that vote happened September 16th, something Circus said would be a devastating blow. While the agenda may not be as interesting as the politics as the politics at this retreat, the ministers do have a set itinerary for their discussions. The retreat includes a full day of meetings on Monday on housing, fairness and affordability, and the middle class. Tuesday is devoted to Canada-U.S. relations. Trudeau launched a new Team Canada mission in the U.S. earlier this year to push Canada interests ahead of the presidential election. The strategy, which Circus jokingly calls the Maple Charm Offensive, is focused on shoring up Canada's defenses in case Donald Trump is voted back into the White House in November, but there are still irritants in the relationship even if Kamala Harris takes office. Harris's meteoric rise in the U.S. may be one of the things that gives new energy to the Liberals. Her Democratic Party and the Liberals overlap on many policy fronts, on everything from school lunches and women's reproductive rights to climate change and clean energy. And actually, I noticed that was kind of interesting because it seems, oddly enough, that it is Democrats in the United States that have adopted the Sunny Ways playbook of the Liberals of about eight to nine years ago and are running with it. I'm noticing a lot of very common themes and uh, ways of framing things. What is not lost on many liberals is that President Joe Biden's decision to drop out of the presidential race brought a sudden surge of energy and momentum to the Democrats. Speculation about Trudeau's future has been a favorite game in Canadian political circles for years. Though he has not suggested he is even considering leaving, Circus says she doesn't think what's happened for the Democrats will compel Trudeau to follow Biden's lead. Quote, I expect to see lots of borrowing of technique, borrowing of language, but a wholesale shift in terms of the person at the front of the stage and on the podium. I don't know that that's in store for the Liberals in the coming week, she said. But there's no question in my mind that much of what we're seeing down there is going to find its way into what happens here in the next six months in terms of agenda, which will probably make Andrew Coyne very, very, very sad. Because it seems that Andrew Coyne believes that liberals are not allowed to copy ideas that other people came up with in other places. They need to be original and find their own ideas or else it's just not fair. Yeah, Andrew Coyne. <laughs> I don't know what it is with this prime minister, but he seems to have a hate on from a mile wide. Um, now, it seems that in terms of the internal politics going on with the party here, uh, we have uh, from the CBC their take on it. 
is as Trudeau cabinet meets liberal MPs look for signs of change following by election loss. So the party members, how would I say, while not necessarily asking for change at the leadership at the moment, at the moment, um, are looking for a definite change, absolute definite change in either strategies, approach, policy, um, how much of and vigor is going to be put into the fight. So uh, we'll see if that's coming. And uh, we have Kits and Cubs breaking news. I do believe we have Grizzly. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My apologies, uh, Kits and Cubs. I slept in completely. Even my Lola alarm did not go off this morning. She uh, she slept in too. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah. Uh, I woke up um, uh, probably, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes ago, something like that. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't hear my alarm. I have two of them. I have my phone alarm and I have an alarm on my bedside uh, uh, Google thing. I didn't hear either one of them. Bridget didn't hear them. And Lola was asleep at her feet. So yeah, it was just one of those, uh, I, I think it was uh, the, a combination of the weekend, all the time in the sun yesterday for both of us. Uh, both Lola and myself, and yeah, I just slept in totally. So I, my apologies, it happens. You know, I'm only human, only human. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I'm right uh, now, Lola, as you can see. <laughs> hey, Lola. Yeah, I uh, got to spend some a lot of quality time with Lola a couple of days uh, ago. I uh, basically walked into Mr. Grizzly's apartment, and uh, Lola did not leave my side for the entire evening. <laughs> Other dogs are here. Yep. I'm part of the pack now. It would seem. Yeah. Um, I see that uh, Kit uh, Dan asked uh, in the chat, sorry, um, they don't scroll when I'm uh, doing the production on the phone, so I actually have to do it with my fingers, so I might be a little behind. But uh, Kit Dan asked, should they wear a mask on the campaign trail? Um, you're probably in a high contact position. Uh, at the moment, so it might not necessarily be a bad idea, uh, especially if you're going into people's houses. If you're still, if you're just standing on the doorstep, you still are outside and properly ventilated and all that kind of stuff. If you maintain the two meter distance, you might you you might be okay. But yeah, if you uh, notice things uh, starting to spike in the in the region, um, like they are, probably expect, a good idea. Yeah, it might be a good idea because you're going back and forth from person to person to person, and in your case specifically, uh, um, you know, every day of campaigning, every day of door knocking is valuable. And uh, the last thing that you want to do, if you're just strictly being selfish and strategic, is do anything that could take you off uh, the campaign trail for a couple of days. So, might be, it might be. Now, of course, you're probably you'll might get some people mentioning things like, you know, why are you wearing a mask when you show up at the, at a door or something? But, um, you know, um, just take that in stride and uh, go ahead and live your best life. But uh, yeah, that, uh, that might, might be a thing that uh, could be uh, somewhat recommended. All right. Um, yeah. I'm going to see if I can jump. I'm going to take Lola back in. I'm going to see if I can jump in on the computer and get everything fixed up. So give me a few minutes. I'll be right back with you. Yeah. Apology. Apologize for my tardiness today. <laughs> Everyone's uh, I'm unemployed, so you know if I sleep in once in a blue moon. <laughs> yep. All right. We'll see you later. Okay. I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay. Bye. Um, so uh, this, according to the CBC, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will meet with his ministers in Halifax on Sunday for the annual cabinet retreat, a gathering that comes after a year of dire polling for the government and disquiet among some Liberal MPs. Some of those MPs are now calling for big changes and for the Prime Minister to publicly show signs of contrition. Yes, that's a, another one that's coming out. Cabinet is meeting for three days and is expected to tackle pocketbook issues and seek to strengthen Canada's relationship with the United States ahead of the House of Commons return in September. Quote, the number one thing I think we need to do is remain grounded in the experience of people who live in our communities, Housing Minister Sean Fraser said on Monday. But members of the Liberal Caucus are watching closely to see whether the Prime Minister has listened to them and will act on any of their ideas following the party's surprise by election loss in June. CBC News spoke to six MPs who say they want to see Cabinet agree on several major measures. A major Cabinet shuffle, 
simplified public messaging, an effort to market the Liberals as a team and a more aggressive communications campaign contrasting the party with the Conservatives. Now, I can see why they would want some of those things. And to be totally honest, these are a lot of things that I've been recommending that they do for quite a while. Um, the last cabinet shuffle, because it moved around faces that we knew mostly into different positions. Um, uh, and, and it was well done. People were moved into positions that they were well suited for and all that kind of stuff. So in that part, I had no problem. But if you wanted to send the message that, uh, you know, uh, we've done a fresh revamp and here are some fresh faces, um, probably not. Right. Um, so if you know, there's a lot of ministers and some of them have been good and they don't necessarily deserve to be demoted. But if the goal is to say, we are going to present a new face with a new team, new faces you haven't seen before, new people to get to know that have interesting and compelling stories uh, because you may be tired of hearing from pa Patty Haidu and you may be tired of hearing um, from Christopher Freeland and you want to see what else have you got. Uh, and to have a new team, uh, that might be it, uh, a good way to do it, to not have uh, Justin Trudeau necessarily be the face of the party, uh, but moving more to a team Trudeau or team liberal uh, advertising uh, or focus on the advertising rather than you know team Justin or Justin is leading his team. You know, it's like, a, you know, there's a competing, that might do it. So you know, um, decreasing his profile somewhat could help. Uh, and yes, uh, definitely, definitely simplified public messaging. I do not know why liberals are so terrible at comms. <sighs> so terrible at comms because there are plenty of achievements. Um, but again, achievements are only going to get you so far every time you're in an election. It's what are you going to do for me next? Even what have you done for me lately doesn't even rate so much anymore. So what are you doing? What are you planning to do for me next? Because i got some real problems now and I need them addressed. And uh, yes, a better campaign contrasting the party with the conservatives definitely would be needed. And in fact, I would say also they need a better instant response mechanism. So if uh, they need a team of people that are basically sitting by the computer monitoring everything that the conservatives are saying, and when they say something that's completely bullshit, that they're out there already with a response, boom, countering, not letting it fester, not letting them, uh, you know, like letting the lie get its pants on and taking a run around the world going, you know, before you can actually, like, notice that it's happening. So uh, a little bit more of an instant response. And if the liberals would do something for the love of God to show that they have some type of real interest in rural Canada, I do not understand yet why there is not still, after all these years, a distinct rural Canada strategy from the liberals and why there is not a strategy for single Canadians. Single parents and single Canadians who are not listening, not necessarily uh, in a marriage or have kids yet. Um, when there's a cost of living increases, you know, if you're two people and you have two incomes, you take a hit, but it's a little easier than if you're alone and you just have one. Right? You don't get the little bit of economies of scale there. So um, something that would speak specifically to single Canadians, whether they're single with children or single just you know making their way in the world um you know the cost of living affected everyone because but if there's only one of you at home to take care of all the bills well then you're eating all the cost yourself and you have no help and that might be a reason for which uh, a lot of the 30 and under demographic are looking elsewhere at the moment because um all the talk is about families and people from the middle class or people who are looking to join the middle class but there are a whole bunch of other people who are single that are not in families that or people that haven't reached the middle class yet and are poorer but they still vote and if you're not speaking directly to them in any kind of way um and the liberals have it actually no parties have really to these particular demographics so um you know First one out that has a compelling offer will probably win. So there are some blind spots here in the party that they could uh, adopt uh, some strategies and policy positions on able to, to be better able to communicate with Canadians. Um, 
quote, I think he just needs to shake things up a bit and be fresh again, because right now we're looking like an old and tired government, said one liberal MP. Some of those MPs said they also want to see Trudeau publicly address what hasn't worked in the past and present a new path forward to turn the Liberals' political fortunes around. David Coletto, CEO, CEO of Abacus Data, said other politicians, including Ontario Premier Doug Ford, quote, have enjoyed a bump in popularity after apologizing or showing signs of contrition and deep empathy for the state of how people are feeling. Trudeau has yet to do that, he said. And it's true, it has worked for Doug Ford, except for some reason people don't seem to notice that he doesn't mean it when he says it. Oddly enough, I don't think we've seen that yet from him in any clear way, and I think that that's a path forward for him if he intends to run again and wants to lead the country into the years ahead, Coletto said. The sources who spoke to the CBC News on condition that they not be named so that they could speak freely said that Trudeau has acknowledged privately what hasn't worked for his government over the past year, but hasn't done so publicly. One MP said the high number of temporary foreign workers and international students being welcomed to Canada is one example of a policy decision the Prime Minister needs to explain to Canadians personally. Coletto said that the current political environment is the most challenging one Trudeau has ever faced. The Liberals have consistently polled about 15 points behind Pierre Polyev's Conservatives over the past year. Quote, if there was an election today, it's highly likely that the Conservatives would not only win the most seats, but would likely form a majority government, said Coletto. They're leading in almost every part of the country. A stunning by-election loss in the former Liberal stronghold of Toronto St. Paul's, blah, 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 that prompted the wave of discomfort and discontent. But with the exception of former Labour Minister Seamus O'Regan's resignation from Cabinet in July, little has changed within the government since that by-election. Then they talk about the things that, <coughs> pardon me, that uh, meeting will, uh, the Cabinet retreat will touch upon, which we've mentioned uh, in the other story. Um, Canadian Ambassador to the U.S. Kristen Hillman and former Ambassadors David McNaughton and Frank McKenna are among those expected to appear at the Cabinet retreat. Flavio Volpe, President of the Automotive Parts Manufacturing Association, said he'll be watching for any indication that Canada will match the U.S. tariff package on China. Those are the tariffs on uh, electric vehicles to try to prevent uh, China from dumping product at a lower price here in Canada. President Joe Biden announced in May that the U.S. would impose new tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, advanced batteries, solar cells, and steel and aluminum used for those kinds of vehicles. And basically, there's a call in Canada to match those tariffs uh, equally. Volpe says, quote, he's fairly confident that the government is going to match the American tariff package, but the Americans, quote, are a little bit nervous about Canada's support. Quote, I think the sooner we get to where the Americans are, the better it will be for our trade relations. And then some MPs said that the rules are look, looking for some inspiration south of the border, as we mentioned before. Two MPs said Trudeau is already trying to match the Democrats' message of joy and optimism, pointing to news conferences this month where Trudeau spoke about the Olympics and Canadian pride. But one Liberal MP pointed out that the Democrats have only held the presidency for four years while Trudeau's government has been powerful much longer. Which is exactly the difference here. There's fatigue that's not cured with a smile, the MP told CBC News. It's not going to work. Another Liberal MP said that while Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris is channeling, channeling the sunny ways messaging that helped bring Trudeau to power in 2015, that approach is no longer resonating for the Prime Minister. Many Liberal MPs said it's critical for Cabinet to embrace improvements to its communication strategy because the party messaging is too complex when compared to the Conservatives. One Liberal MP said they want a Cabinet to match how Harris and her vice presidential candidate Tim Walz are targeting Republican Donald Trump and his running mate J.D. Vance. They said Harris is effectively presenting the Democrats as a party of hope and the future and casting the Republicans as problematic. Liberal MP Nate Erskine-Smith said he wants the party to run ads, quote, to educate Canadians about Polyev's track record and the choice Canadians face. One Liberal MP said they still believe Trudeau has to resign. Two others said it's too late to replace him and there isn't anyone better placed to take on Polyev. Um, multiple Liberal MPs said they want to see a major cabinet shuffle sweep out ministers who aren't delivering and pulling the political weight. One source said the caucus has been circulating a list of cabinet ministers some MPs want to see dropped from cabinet. The retreat comes ahead of by-elections set for September 16th. One Liberal MP told the CBC News that if the party loses the Montreal riding, traditionally a safe Liberal seat, it will be, quote, another huge blow that will prompt more questions about Trudeau's leadership. A second Liberal MP said the by-election will be very telling and solidify one way or another what the future of the Liberal Party is going to be. So you, there you go, kids and cubs. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about that. Yesterday was the first day. There'll be two more days. I'm sure there'll be lots of news coming from it. Uh, 
and again with the liberals trying to present the best case for it, despite all these rumblings uh background going on in the background uh, so yes you know we're having some frank and kind of discussion uh but we remain uh, a team and we're all going to roll in the same direction and once we get through this retreat we'll have a path forward and we'll all be enthusiastic about it and everybody will buy in and we'll be ready to take on pierre will probably be the message that has been uh, already scored for here one one would have to assume i think oh i have something i got to share with you guys quickly yes please quickly. uh you've already seen this sir because you're yes. there uh, let's see how I can, uh, there, it's this, just, come on, there, we, oh, that's not, what's going on here? It's not spotlighting correctly. There oh. we go. Okay. Oh, that's weird. Let's see if I can, nope. Hang on. Ah, can't get it to spotlight correctly. Anyway, we'll run with this. Oh. That was yesterday. Very, very happy moment. I just uh, captured a few seconds of the two of you meeting for the very first time in person. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I thought I'd put that on the screen, even though. Uh, uh, so here's the weird thing: is like um, when when we have. So when you're setting up to produce the show, what you what you're not aware of, like I've produced many from my phone. What you're not aware of, sir, is that there's a little button um, that shows computer screen or phone screen. Okay. When you, yeah, when you start to show it in phone screen like this mode, you can't yes. change it once you start broadcasting. That's what I kind of tried to figure out. I was because I saw the button afterwards and yeah. I tried to push it and it couldn't happen. So that's so that's yeah. why we're in this this mode because once you start broadcasting, you cannot change it. So. Ah, yeah. All anyway, right, it's fine. We're here. We got a show, and uh, apologies to everyone for you know arriving ninety minutes late <laughs> because you know I slept way in today. So um, who's Forrest Savage? Uh, Trudeau is not even a politician. That dude is straight up criminal. Okay. A new per a new person on the on the chat today who um, again. Um, uh, I took some time to make the house rules. It seems that a uh, person uh, understood them, uh, but may not because uh, Trudeau is a straight up criminal. Criminal is not a fact. Based. So, uh, well, well, Mr. Savage, uh, I just want to address this. No, 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 no. no. They, they've been told. Like, no, no, so I'm going to address one comment here. There's says, somebody please tell me a single positive qualification of Trudeau. Well, uh, he was a school teacher and he taught math he taught a single semester of drama and everybody calls him a drama teacher he's got one semester of, he taught math and literature he actually uh, prior to that he worked as a snowboard instructor and a bouncer so unlike the opposition leader who's only ever worked in politics the prime minister of canada has actually actually worked in the real world despite the fact that he comes from essentially Canadian royalty when it comes to politics, but he's actually worked in the real world. So Mr. Savage, just trying to be polite here, letting you know, he has more qualifications to be prime minister than the leader of the opposition does. The leader of the opposition has only ever been a politician. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. He's never done anything else. So the, the prime minister of Canada is actually far more qualified because he's lived in the real world. And he also sat at the knee of the prime minister for, you know, a decade or so. So he knows more about politics than you are or I ever will. Yeah. And it's that simple. Yeah. It seems that there was a, a bit of a debate that uh, came between, uh, you know, the benefits of capitalism and the benefits of socialism and all that kind of stuff. And um, which is, you know. Oh, yeah. We can have that debate. That's, that's a legitimate debate. Um, yeah. not, not, not particularly related to anything um stated in the show however um so it seems like a uh, a random choice for a topic mm -hmm. of conversation uh but hey the, we don't we don't tell you what it is that to talk about when we're no, doing no. this hopefully you pick up on things on the show and discuss those things uh but nothing stops you from bringing in your own topics but uh Yes, given that there's everybody watching the show on the political spectrum from green to NDP 
too liberal to progressive conservatives, and then people who are further on the on the extremes from that, uh, who are probably, like I said, more hate watching us or monitoring us than anything. Um, yes, if you have a view that uh, capitalism is great and you know it's wonderful, uh, yes, you will have people in the chat that have uh, that are more. Uh, socialist or social democratic mm. uh, that will talk to you about the limits of capitalism and where capitalism they believe uh, is maybe not the best solution or strict unbridled unfettered capitalism uh, you know they might want capitalism with the, some rules and some guardrails uh, or capitalism with a, a bit of a social component to it social capitalism so you know that type of stuff uh, could happen uh, but uh, you know People again, uh, you know, reacting to someone saying capitalism is great or socialism is great and coming up with another perspective again is not an attack. It's just sort of oh, no. why I think you're wrong. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, you know, if, if, if he really wants to know about what uh, benefits folks living in rural areas, we, we do have a farmer on the show married to a cowboy who might be able to inform you of that, Mr. Savage. So just letting you know, uh, one of, one of our, one of our uh, loyal, uh, friends and followers who has been incredibly generous with us has, uh, well, grew up on a farm in rural, rural, uh, prairies. I'm not going to get geographic here, but in the prairies in a rural area and, uh, knows more about it than you or I could ever actually say because it uh, directly affected by it. I'm a city mouse. Yeah, me too. Now, here we go. Here's a comment from, from one of the kids. Forrest, Saskatchewan relies heavily on the federal government to build roads and infrastructure for mining and oil and gas industries. There you go. There you go. Yep. So, you know, it, you, you ask the questions, Forrest, and we will respond. Uh, it, maybe, maybe Mr. Beaver and I won't respond directly, but the kids and cubs will, will address you. They will discuss it with you. And, and as long as, again, as long as we're civil and polite in the chat, you're welcome to stay and have a good time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's for everyone, right? If somebody doesn't share mm -hmm. the experience as you, uh, it's not necessarily that, uh, you know, they don't have enough life experience or something yet. It's, you know, we just all come from different places. That's right. That's right. We just all come from different places. So, uh, you know, just a little kindness and an openness to the fact that people will see the different ways. And, you know, you can have an exchange, debate it vigorously, uh, agree to agree on certain things, agree to disagree on other things. And uh, like I said, at the end of every show, we hug it out. Right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, since I've been doing most of the talking since this has started, uh, have you got anything? I do have something that just came across my timeline here. And I want to put this on the screen because I'm like, oh, hell yes. Uh, now it's going to be difficult because we're in we're in uh, form phone format mode, but I will put this on the screen to share with people and read it out loud because this is uh, hella cool. Let's see if I can make this appear a little bit bigger. No, that won't work. <laughs> so uh, I won't put it on the screen. I will just um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take it off and it'll just be the two of us and I'll read it out loud for the kids and cubs. And this is from uh, Duncan Ray on the Twitter. And he says, my jaw is on the floor. Did you know that high speed rail between Ottawa and Montreal would cost just $2.26 billion? This is according to a 2023 report get by Cambria, C Cambia Consulting. For reference, and those of us in Ottawa know this well, that's half the cost of LRT Stage 2. Half the cost. So Stage 2 for the LRT in Ottawa is $4 billion. Mm. He's like 70% of this track uh, of $2.2 billion for high speed between Ottawa and Montreal would um, operate at 320 kilometers per hour. That's 20 trains a day, 20 trains a day. Travel time between Ottawa and Montreal, 50 minutes, 50 minutes. I'm like, oh, we need to build this. Yes. We need to build this right now. <laughs> like, holy crap. 50 minutes to get from Ottawa to Montreal by train and think of how many people can be moved on a train in that time period. Right. <clears throat> right. Yep. Like, we need that. Like it'd be 20 trains a day. 
So think about that. 320 kilometers per hour, 20 trains at, uh, per day, travel time 50 minutes. You could have people going back, living in Montreal and commuting back and forth and vice versa. People living in Ottawa and commuting to Montreal. 50 minutes. I mean, hell, there are people who already make the commute in this city that take longer than that. Mm -hmm. Think about it. That, that would be incredible. I would love to see that. I'm like, make this happen. Oh, and here's the best part. <laughs> the next tweet. I'm the author of this report. Oh. It's important to note it's that the cost assumes we adopt the best procurement and construction practices used in places like Italy and Spain, where they build high-speed rail at low cost. The fact is we have some of the best conditions for high-speed rail in Eastern Canada. I'm like, let's make this happen. I, pff, let's make it happen. Yep. So they're saying, uh, somebody says, I've heard 20 billion for a Windsor to Quebec city corridor. That seems realistic. I assume this would be use some existing uh, right of way for, for tracks. That said, double it just to be sure. Um, hang on a second. Oh, here's the best part. I got the entire report. I'm going to put it, uh, it's directly from the author. Whoops. Hang on. Sorry. From the author. And let me just get this link here. I will put it in the chat. This is the fr directly from the author of the report. Uh, and this, this is, this is kick-ass awesome. Sorry, I get excited about stuff like this because it's, it's talking about how we can make the world a better place and move people back and forth uh, in, in a um, clean uh, environment. Uh, do it quickly. And, mm -hmm. uh, this is great. Yep. No, we, we, we need that in the in this corridor, and it would solve uh, a lot of problems in terms of congestion if they can. They were able to do it and uh, you know offer tickets at a at, at a good rate. Affordable because price. Yes. Like Via is a really really good service, but it's it just too damn expensive. It, it's it's expensive and it's slow. And the other thing is because it shares tracks with CNCPKC. I know that's a lot of letters, but <laughs> because it shares tracks with, with freight, there are times when they have to pull over for 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're taking a day train on a Tuesday, you might have to pull over outside of Kingston for 20 or 30 minutes, which yep. is, you know, not practical if you're trying to get back and forth from Ottawa to Toronto, Montreal to, to Ottawa, uh, less affected by the freight, but you still can sometimes be pulled over a little less affected because it's, you know, it's not the same corridor, but yeah, um, build this. Let's build this. Make mm -hmm. it happen. This yeah, would be absolutely. awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just, um, kids and cubs, uh, I, I just want to mention, uh, like I said, I haven't been able to follow the conversation, but uh, a lot of the conversation that I see from our latest uh, member, Forrest, is a lot of uh, apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm here. Please don't put uh, a new kit in the position of having to apologize mm -hmm. all the time. Okay, not not everybody comes to the discussion with the same level of knowledge. Uh, if they're coming here uh, to get some information, listen to what we have to say, and be exposed, um, let's again, as we say on the show, we don't care when you get here because we just care that you arrive. So, yes. yeah. um, like I said, there's, but there's on everyone's side, there's no need to be aggressive. All right. We are all of good intent. Okay. Oh, uh, just wanted to add a little note um, for those of you who are, were not aware that the uh, Ottawa Red Blacks are undefeated at home still <laughs> after beating BC here at home on Saturday evening. Uh, Ottawa has not lost once at home this season. Uh, we have a tie. There was one game that ended in a tie after double overtime, but no losses for the Red Blacks. They are uh, six, two, and one this season. So I'm like, we may be Grey Cup bound, which makes me very, very happy. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, makes me happy too. We watched part of the game, even which was yeah, we did. We watched a bit of the game on on Saturday night. Yes, we did. A, it was a good game too. It was, yes, yes, indeed. Oh, uh, all right, kids and cubs. Uh, let's see what else I have for you today. Uh, and probably be this last little bit, uh, given that uh, we've been talking a lot today. Um, oh, by the way, 
uh, with the 26th, so I believe, Paralympics start in two days, Canada. So uh, let's get ready to get our cheer on for that. Um, the U.S. Open, also because you know I'm a tennis fan, starts today. Uh, there are no Canadians playing today. Uh, it seems that all the Canadian men are on the top half of the draw. Uh, so we, I, I believe we have three men. Uh, in the, the main draw, we have um, Denis Shapoval and we have uh, Felix Ogiel-Yassim, who are two usual standard bettors, uh, but Gabriel Diallo, as we, we mentioned the other day, uh, emerged through quali uh, qualifying. Uh, all three of them have winnable first round matches. Uh, so it should be interesting. Uh, on the women's side, we have Bianca Andrescu, who's in really, really tough taking up, the, taking on the number five in the world and French Open finalist, uh, Jasmine Paolini, uh, who's been having like a really, really, really good run uh, mm -hmm. the last months. So uh, Andrescu might be uh, in tough there. Um, Fernandez has a, a better draw uh, for first round, but still um, tough. Uh, because you know you can have somebody with you know if you've got qualifiers even in the 200s in the the first round um you know if you're a seeded player which fernandez is because she's in the top 32 in the world you're guaranteed not to play a top 32 player but uh, you could pick number 33 which is still a tough first round match and she got somebody that in the first round who's in the, in the 40s so uh a tough uh, first round match uh, because often your first round match, if you're seated players against somebody that's in the the low 100, you know, low double low double digits, 98, 99, 80 something, or uh, in the the triple digits, and she did not get that as a first draw. <laughs> so um, it, it could be quite possible that our two female competitors are out in the first round. That mm -hmm. is a possibility because uh, they they just got terrible, terrible terrible draws <laughs> but that's the draw that's the thing yeah, tennis yeah, all, uh, all cool. the names go in the hat the the top 32 get placed uh, in the grid and then what comes out is what comes out mm. right Indeed. yep okay um I was trying to find something somebody sent to me earlier that i i don't know where i placed it and if i can find it uh i will share it with everybody just don't know where it went. <laughs> okay. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, since we talked about uh, trains, Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, Kansas City, uh, there was a rail strike and a lockout, rail strike from one and lockout, uh, that had been, uh, seemed to have been uh, brought about. And... Um, Government of Canada decided to bring this to the Canada Industrial Relations Board, and uh, and it imposed binding arbitration on the parties. Um, and there's an article in I, I Politics about this, uh, but this is dated from the 24th, so uh, it's a little uh, dated now. Um, it says that uh, Jeanette Brazo, uh, I believe, is the person who is a uh, looking overseeing this at the moment if i'm not mistaken and uh, she says the board has concluded that in this case it has no discretion or ability to refuse to implement in whole or in part the minister's directions or to modify their terms so she ordered the two companies and their conductors dispatchers and yard workers concerned to resume operations starting at 12:01 a.m on monday uh, just today. On top of ending the lockout simultaneous strike at CPKC, the ruling avoids the 72-hour strike notice the CN union issued on Friday morning. Teamster said it will comply with the tribunal's decision but plans to appeal the ruling in court, arguing, quote, it sets a dangerous precedent. Quote, it signals to corporate Canada that large companies need only stop their operations for a few hours, inflict short-term economic pain, and the federal government will step in to break a union, said Paul Boucher, president of the Teamsters Canada Rail Conference. The rights of Canadian workers have been significantly diminished today, he said in release. Canada's largest railway says it aims to ramp up shipments as quickly as possible. Quote, over the last nine months, CN negotiated in good faith. Mm. 
I'm not sure about that. Mm. To reach Neil at the table, the company consistently proposed offers with better pay, improved rest, more re- predictable schedules, and a voluntary mobile workforce. While CN is disappointed an agreement could not be reached at the bargaining table, the company is satisfied that this order effectively ends the unpredictability that has been negatively impacting supply chains for months. And the reason for which I say, mm, I'm not sure about that, because uh, had CN not decided to time its lockout to coincide with the start of the 72-hour strike, notice at TPKC, yeah. thus posing on the entire nation an economic bear hug, mm. I am be a little more inclined to say, you know what, we really came with good faith, but they didn't do that, so I'm skeptical. <laughs> uh, the Labor Board ruled that binding arbitration will kick off on August 29th. Um, so that's what's going on on that front, uh, Kits and Cubs. Um, so yes, it seems that the Teamsters are going to bring this to court, but uh, not to try and stop this order or to get it rescinded so that they can go uh, uh, go back on full strike and that uh, shipments will stop, but more for uh, the future. Uh, so if there anybody's in this situation again, uh, you know, maybe set some ground rules as to uh, how quickly the government can order you into binding arbitration. Uh, before giving the companies a couple of days where um, some of the public discontent uh, could land at their feet. Mm -hmm. Those of the workers or the government for not having acted fast enough, but at their own feet, uh, which might provide them some incentive or motivation to reach a deal more than they have now, especially when they can engineer things such that... uh, um, it creates such a strain on the economy that uh, the first pressure goes on the federal government to do something, uh, which then gives them a free pass because it is their duty to negotiate. Indeed. I have something here um, uh, regarding Pierre Polyev's uh, bizarre video from him last week. Yes. The Common Sense Calgary Stampede 2024 thing that he held. Uh, and, and this is a recent uh, statement, um, and it's been interpreted to us by Barney Panofsky's best intentions. My name's not Gordy. And after the man dropped his child off at Bootstraps Academy for old stock children, the man drove his Zamboni to his job at the hockey stick factory, from where he bought, brought home a good paying paycheck and paid no taxes for anything. And after work... The man built his own home, and once the man finished that house with no interference from building inspectors or all the other gatekeepers, the man went to his second job in the oil fields, and the man stood atop an oil rig admiring the mighty Matterhorn off in the distance, and the man said, bring it home. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but that, <laughs> that's entirely too funny to let go. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I saw that, and I'm like, oh, I... I that's simply brilliant. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, simply brilliant. Now I do uh, have a video. Um, this is this is uh, that did come across my feed uh, last night, or I guess very early this morning. And it, it it's uh, says guess who Chris Barber met with on January twenty fifth, twenty twenty two, on his way to Ottawa. Andrew Shear. And it says, and you can tell these two totally staged this video because they uh, keep over contradicting each other. Chris is like, I met with Andrew Shear, like Boro didn't know, but he knew he interviewed them. He says, so yeah, I have a, a video clip of it here, but I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to show it on this or not. But let's see, let's see if I can make it work. I will try. I will try. And if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, that's not it. Uh, where, where did it go? There we go. Let's see if I make this function properly. Well, this is a, as best as I can do it, but just watch this. Okay. You rolled in on the 29th. Okay, so that's Saturday. That's Saturday. Saturday. And then Parliament starts on Monday morning, so we have a day of getting ready. And okay. So I met with Andrew Shearer. I think it was last yeah, night. Yeah, last night. We, we met yeah. with you. We yeah. interviewed you go, yeah. a little bit. And I see they, Jeremy Patzer and Sophia the day before that. Or, okay, or this so. Saturday, Ottawa. Stay tuned. Yeah. So we, we've got a couple of, of uh, individuals here who met with former leader of the opposition party, Andrew Scheer, mm. prior to their arrival in Ottawa during the occupation. Mm. So 
somebody's got to answer to that <laughs> because yep. uh, mm, that is that's that's that which we suspected all along is now being confirmed. Yes, exactly. It, that they showed up and then conservatives saw it and said, hey, here's a great opportunity to piggyback on it. It seems that there might have been some discussions beforehand. A little positioning. Maybe that's why Pierre had all those Pierre for Prime Minister flags already ready. Yeah. Like, he wasn't even leader of the party at the time. Yeah. Aaron O'Toole Indeed. was. So I, you know, I, I constantly hear people say he had flags made. I'm like, I don't know if he had them made. But I find it weird that Pierre Polyev uh, suddenly wanted to be prime minister and people had flags saying so. Sorry, just a second. Lola's trying to get a treat. Come on, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got her lay on. Um, so, yeah. It, it's, it's all, it stinks to high heaven is what it does. It stinks yeah. to high heaven. And I think we need to look into this a little bit further because if these... Uh, conspiracy I'm trying to be polite here but these folks with insane conspiracy theories uh, suddenly were, were interviewing and meeting with the former leader of the opposition party before they arrived in Ottawa mm -hmm. uh, that color and texture there's greasiness there in a big bad way well see it's one of these things that we need to understand right when we're analyzing what happened things happen in time in a sequence and often when people are looking back well they like to either omit things or change things in time well this happened it's like no things happen in in a sequence and if discussions were had before they arrived that just puts an entirely different frame on everything because if it's some Thing where people showed up and then said, hey, this situation is brewing and here's an opportunity for us to position ourselves. That's one thing. Yes. The thing is coming and we want in on it. So let's make some time and space for these people before they arrive so we can coordinate our strategies. Isn't it entirely different? Kevin? Well, here is actual video of the meeting with him. Watch this. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'll see you in a second here. I'm not sure who that person Hi, is. Sherry. Sherry, how are you doing? Hi, good, you? There. Andrew Shear meeting with him. Good to see you. Welcome to Balgoni. How are you? Regina Capel. Is this official? Uh, official conservative support? Or well, I'm here to support. Our, our, our position is that nobody should lose their job for a health care decision. And uh, truckers were essential workers for two years during the pandemic, and yeah. the government hasn't explained why things need to change. And so. Good answer. Yeah. Okay, uh, he has to answer to me. Because the thing that we all need to remember is truckers were still allowed to work. We were allowed to move goods and services across this country if you were not vaccinated as a truck driver. 90% of truck drivers were vaccinated and mm -hmm. were working. The only ones who could not cross the border in the United States of America were those who did not choose to get a vaccination. You were and still allowed to work in Canada. And that was, and it was, that was the government the, of the United States of America who said you couldn't come in, not ours. It was Joe Biden, not Pierre Trudeau, uh, Justin Trudeau, sorry. It was Joe Biden who made that statement and said, you cannot cross the border in the United States of America if you are not vaccinated. And we went, okay, well, it's your border. It's your country. We can't tell you how to run your nation. So this, I'm trying to be polite here, mm -hmm. and I'm really biting my tongue on this one, but Andrew Scheer needs to answer to the Canadian people about this video. And while he's there, he can talk about Mike Roman. Yeah. Indicted. Yeah in the United States several times, Mike Roman. For some reason, our media is completely uncurious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you were saying something earlier, Mr. Grizzly, we couldn't hear you, you seem to have been on mute. Oh, sorry, no, no, it's, it's fine. Um, just uh, like Saucy C was just saying, truckers were busy working while the faux truckers partied in the street. No, it, it was Joe Biden, actually, um, anti-corporatist, I think, at the time. Because, uh, Trump. was it Trump? or I think yeah, Trump, Trump shut the border down, and then Biden was 
took over yeah. shortly thereafter. Because, well, it was 2020, it was January 6, 2020. And 2022 is when the border was still closed. And that's why they came here to protest. And I'm like, what are you protesting? The mandates. Yeah. yeah. Provincial. But <laughs> You're in the wrong from, city. Yeah, but from, but from December 2019 all the way through November 2020. Correct. Um, it was Trump. So that's the better part of the year. Yeah, yes. it was Trump. And, and those uh, those mandates were uh, the anti crossing the border mandates were already in place at that point. Correct. It was Trump who started it, and Biden just carried it on. Yeah. Yeah, because Biden was in power for in 2022. Biden had been in power for two years at that point, and the the, the mandates were still in place then. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, I'm like, that's why, you know, in, in, in my ranting video, it was like, if you need to complain to somebody, do it to Joe Biden, because Justin Trudeau has nothing to do with uh, allowing you to cross into the United States of America. Now, Americans wanting to drive, who are not vaccinated, who wanted to drive trucks in Canada and couldn't do it because we imposed the same rule, because they would have to complain to Trudeau. But if you're a Canadian trucker and you were complaining to Trudeau, um, yes. Like, yeah. um, why are you so, talking to me? <laughs> well, and here we have the anti-corporatist who is the anti-corporatist who is a trucker who actually yes. has joined us on the podcast on, uh, uh, at a pubcast actually from mm -hmm. his truck. Uh, yep. So he's like, I just kept on trucking. I was able to get the jab early as an essential worker. Yep. Yep. Like I said, people were given a choice at the time. You mm -hmm. can get vaccinated, and here's all the things that you can do. You can get not vaccinated, and here are the things you can do. Correct. And the list of things that you could do if you chose not to be vaccinated was smaller. There is no constitutional right to like your choices. No. Or to be offered only choices you like. So, But everybody knew. Everybody had the option. Correct. And it turned around and says, well, no, they forced. Well, no. Is that if you wanted to keep on still going across the border, then yes, you had to. But nobody forced you. You were still free to make the choices. Or no, yeah. But if I didn't, I would have lost my. Job. I would have lost that job. Well, yes, you would have lost that job because, because you decided that you were not prepared to meet the requirements of your job, which is again a choice that you were free to make. Correct. Now you could have still driven domestically, or you could have gone and got trained to do another job. So nobody was denying you a right to employment. Mm -hmm. This and nobody's entitled. You knows I'm doing this. Like this, I'm not in. I'm entitled to earn a living. I'm not entitled to do this specifically. Correct. Earn my living. Right. It's like, and there are other now. If you make that choice, of course, there's a cost to you, and that you have to look for another job, or you have to retrain. Yeah, which is difficult. It's a harder path, but is a path you choose. Mm -hmm. They might be unenviable choices, but it's still a path you choose. It wasn't like they had roaming hordes or bands of government exactly. officials at your door, strapping you down and putting an injection into you. Like this. Or so, if you don't yeah. Get this injection, you can't leave your home or you can't do this, but that never there took might place. Have been, there might have been con conditions that were put in place to try to nudge you in one direction rather than another. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we do that all the time because when Stephen Harper was prime minister and had his boutique tax credits and said, hey, kid, you know, if you register your kids in these arts programs or these sports programs, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, include the bill in your taxes and you'll get X number of receipts. No. Because, hey, we're going to put additional taxes on cigarettes to try and so, I mean, we use laws and we use tax systems and whatnot to incentivize behavior one way or another way but you have the choice to do it or not it's like so the let's take about the most extreme thing murder it's like you have the choice to commit murder we have laws against it to try to incentivize you not to do it people still do make it twice but people still do it and then there's a consequence mm -hmm. right so it's it's not like somebody's like comes like oh it's like you're thinking about murdering someone yeah, it was like, and we, I mean, like if you're saying it online and we find you, well, then yes, people are going to try and prevent a murder. <laughs> but, you know, but it's not like, it's like, but that was my freedom of expression, stabbing that person in the heart 17 times. No, that's not a legitimate 
<laughs> freedom of yeah course. well there, there, there's, there's a lot of things at play here right so i mean one of one of the things we have to to acknowledge is that again uh for those of of, of you who are new to the show uh and, and we had a gentleman here the other day from the uk who was saying well you guys were locked down it's like nope never nope. locked down never locked down. never locked down businesses were asked to close nobody actually forced them to do it no nope. They were asked, they're like, please close so we can control the spread. And everybody went, okay. Nobody was forced to do anything. And that was, it's like the the folks who seem to think, oh, they made businesses close. No, they actually did not. They were saying, we we need you to close to control the spread. We don't want to have our hospitals overrun and people dying unnecessarily because of blah, 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 blah. And that is is what took place. By their employees for creating an unsafe work environment. Correct. Right. So that is what took place. And there are many folks who seem to think, well, no, didn't you? No, we were never locked down. Never. I was nope. allowed to come and go as I chose. We when had nothing like closed, China, nothing no, like China God, no. or Italy, right? Nothing. Like the worst that happened, the absolute worst was in Quebec. They had a curfew Yes. for a while, but that was the closest to any type of lockdown. And forever. that was only in Quebec. That didn't happen in any other part of Canada. And I, I do remember there was a, because, you know, I can see Quebec from my rooftop. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, it's lighter. It's across the river from where I live. Right. And here's the thing. There was a woman who decided she, uh, they were like, you can go out and walk your dog, but you need to, otherwise you need to stay in during their curfew. And there was a woman who was, uh, got ticketed. I, I, I don't think she was arrested. I think she was ticketed because she put a collar on her husband and took him for a walk. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and she got she got ticketed for it. I, she wasn't arrested, but she, she did get a ticket for that. She goes, what? I'm walking my dog. He's a dog. I'm walking him. They're like, no. No, you're out past curfew. Get back in your house. She did get a ticket for it. I remember mm-hmm. when that happened, and I went, well, Clever. <laughs> Clever attempt. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Points for creativity, but no. <laughs> once again, once again, from Saucy Sea Witch, just just a, a brilliant statement on her part. I'm not sure why being civilized and trying to help protect other people was such a problem. It's been ridiculous. Entitled, spoiled people who haven't been properly disciplined were on full display. Yeah, I'm like yeah, yeah, You're and then right, and then the other argument that's made that go along with that because then the protest happened was a what weren't accounts frozen and all that kind of stuff so accounts were frozen yes a very very small amount of them and uh, most of them for 24 to 48 hours Correct. at the most in order again once again to provide people with an incentive to leave because there was a whole organization there that was raising money from and a lot of it was dark money coming from foreign mm-hmm. sources not all of it but a good chunk mm-hmm. of it like this and trying to finance the people give envelopes of money to the people that were there to keep on protesting in violation of the law. So yes. Uh, and participants who were affected by that had a chance to challenge that in court. It got challenged in Ontario superior court and the judge did determine that while the government did have a constitutional right to do that under section one of the Canadian constitution that says all rights have reasonable limits but there's it so long as those limits are enforced in such a way as to cause minimal disruption and effect and and affect the lowest number of people possible and what the judge had determined in that case is that while imposing the freeze on the bank accounts met the first test that it was in the interest and there was a way to do it and that Mm -hmm. there was a legitimate reason for it to be done that it was not done in a way uh, that would minimize disruption. Like, for example, if someone had a joint bank account uh, and the person that was on the joint bank account wasn't in Ottawa protesting, well, they were affected as well. Correct. Number one. And number two, the other reason was is because the police were going to the bank and saying, okay, we have these people. Please look at their accounts. And then the bank would give the information directly to the police rather than having an independent third-party intermediary where the police would ask the judge for the bank mm-hmm give the information the bank would present the information to a judge the judge would look at it and say okay this information can come this information not and then hand it so there just needed to be because but had it had been put in place in that way 
then it would have indeed been indeed be sorry indeed been totally constitutional so it wasn't the idea that was unconstitutional it was the execution as we say often on the show it ain't what you do it's the way that you do it right so that mm -hmm. was the case. and these lessons have been learned and now if ever a situation like that happens again this then the government will know that they can impose that so long as these things first go through a judge right so th those were the things that were determined that's uh, and that's where things were were left off at uh, the end of it so um um yeah you know it's uh and you know the people are screaming ty tyranny and dictatorship well if it was a tyranny and dictatorship there would have been no recourse to go to the courts to get a judge to take a look at it and apply a hindsight test which is usually not very much judicially recommended but in this case it was allowed to stand in order to come back and make that determination right because the government when they're making these decisions they're not making these decisions in hindsight they're making them in mm -hmm. real time the information that they have at the time exactly so, a hindsight test um it doesn't always wash well when you consider you know yeah. you're you've you've got a, a, a global pandemic that we've not faced in over a hundred years what are we going to do okay with a normal virus that we don't know what it's going to do exactly i think if it was the spanish flu all over again we'd have some type of idea but this wasn't the spanish flu it was something else it was a that novel coronavirus and you know they did what they had to do at the time what, what was it that the, the head of the world health organization said you're going to make mistakes oh yeah said, in a situation like this move fast move quickly move fast and overshoot me. move fast overshoot and when it's done if people turn around and says geez you guys overreacted for nothing you did well you did well you did well because you have to remember we didn't know at the time what this was going to do we were and millions of people died from it yep, it was like hiv all over again yes yes when hiv came out in the early 80s we didn't know what it was going to do we didn't know how it was transmitted we didn't know how long people some people declined really quickly some people do, did decline didn't decline so much as all we didn't know why uh we didn't know what drugs we took something called azt when we had the chance that was a failed cancer drug uh that was deemed too toxic to give to people with cancer, but they turned around and said, hey, we have nothing else. And it did help some people, but another other people, it was a devastating drug. But we've been through this before. We've been through this before. It's a novel virus yeah. coming up, causing a global pandemic. And there were rules and regulations. Now, fortunately, HIV was not airborne. Yeah, so, can you imagine if it was like my goodness gracious. Please. Uh yeah. That would have killed but, us all. I mean, but it was being, you know, through bodily fluid and you know, sexual activity. And it's like, well, sex is the one one of the one of the two things we're programmed to do as a species. Mm -hmm. as so in terms of transmitting a virus, I mean, it's one of the most clever ways if you actually had to design one, because pretty much everybody has sex at some point. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, but we, you know, eventually we figured it out. And now here we are, you know, 40 years later. Uh, and now we have, you know, th there's a cocktail, but it's still no party. Uh, but we do have cocktails of drugs and, you know, better medical inf information, better medical treatments. And now, mm -hmm. you know, if you are someone who contracts HIV in 2024, chances are that your lifespan is going to be pretty much normal, maybe save a couple of years. And that's, you know, maybe from more result of like pumping, you know, medications and chemicals in your body all your life to keep yourself alive than actual HIV. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you can uh, get the suppress the virus in your body to a point where it's undetectable. And so much now the scientific study has proven that if you're undetectable, you can't even transmit it. Correct. Uh, there was a time, uh, I'm old enough to remember, because I'm yeah. from this community, from the gay community, I'm old enough to remember a time where people who were HIV positive necessarily had to disclose to every sexual partner that they were before they had it. Yeah. Before they had sex, or else if somebody found out, you know, it was like an aggravated sexual assault. Yeah. Oh, no. People should go to jail. I, yeah. I believe. Correct and that was. Weren't some people charged with aggravated sexual assault in some cases? Yeah. 
there were some cases where it did happen like this. And uh, if you were a Canadian, for example, uh, up until uh, George Bush II, when he finally removed it, you were not even allowed to enter the United States. Correct. At all. Correct. Not even to visit. There was no visa. There was no exception. Even mm -hmm. if you were in good health, there was not, you were just not allowed. Yeah. And if you were, and if you did, and you were found out, it's like you could have severe consequences. Most likely, what would happen is you'd be sent back, and you'd be put on a list, and you can never enter the United States ever, ever, ever again. Um, but uh, fortunately, that rule changed because you know, I mean, it's not like we're walking around and coughing and spreading it. You actually have to do something or decide not to do something actively. Right in order to contract it you either have to like decide that you are going to have unprotected sexual relations or share a needle or something like that you know you have to do it it's actually hard to get you have to deliberately do something or choose not to do something not so for COVID. no that because, was airborne and, and we all breathe and we can't help but breathe i i, I i've We're tried holding my breath uh, after about 60 seconds I'm, I'm gasping for air so you know. that was an entirely different beast it was an entirely different beast yes but we did learn stuff from the 80s oh, from yeah. the HIV epidemic and how you know uh, how, how viruses and novel viruses spread and all that kind of stuff and what happens you know and you know back then we took some drastic measures just like this time we took some drastic measures it's just that because you know HIV was harder to uh, spread, harder to contract, and the incubation period was much longer. Um, you know, uh, and fortunate, so fortunately, it didn't affect uh, as many people as COVID did, and um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, for um, most people contracted contracted it later because HIV first affected people who didn't matter. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, people, yeah, yeah. migrant workers, uh, that's right. depending where you were in the world, it was different people, uh, sex trade workers, injection drug users, um, you know, uh, peoples from a certain community, the communities, ethnically or whatnot, that all people already look down their noses on or already considered filthy or dirty. Um, you know, the, the good, decent people of the world mm. needed not to worry about it because, you know, it was only affecting those people until the population jumped. Okay, so I'm going to answer a question here in the chat because I don't know if you can see the chat. Uh, Four Savage is asking, uh, he'd like to know uh, who we are, uh, our credentials. He says, I genuinely think you guys are really smart. I'm like, okay. Uh, well, to begin with, sir, I am a working class stiff who just happens to be gifted with a very deep voice. And I'm pretty good at voice acting. Uh, but that's it. I'm, a, I'm I've worked in IT telecom for 30 plus years. I'm old and crusty and broken, but I read nonstop all the time. I'm always trying to get more information about every subject I can devour. Whereas Mr. Beaver, well, he can tell you about himself. Yes. Um, Jack of several trades, but my formal training education wise is in communications and worked for several years as a political communication strategist. Uh, have been a political junkie since I was 10. Um, so, yeah, I'm one of those weird freaks uh, <laughs> uh, with a, um, a mind that uh, is almost like a filing cabinet mm -hmm. that I can tell things and say, hey, didn't this thing happen three years ago? And I can go back and retrieve it. Um, but uh, strategic political communications is uh, kind of my thing. And uh, we're in the, the fourth season of this show, which is based on a blog, a political blog that I had been uh, running that was uh, strictly written for 10 years before that. So in terms of doing this particular type of work, uh, I'm now close to my 14th or 15th of doing this so there's a, a lot of data in the data banks there mm -hmm. uh, in also, case, I uh, just, i'm just a, a, a an individual who is who is greatly concerned about the political situation in all of north america not just canada but also when when trump first uh came to power i went oh shit <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, good. and then on the other front uh back in the day uh i was um a very 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 good debater mm -hmm. was named to the national team i'm a uh, master debater yes in my last year of high school so uh 
making arguments that don't uh, require ad hominem or don't require logical right. fallacies or sophistry or that type of stuff. Um, it's kind of my jam. <laughs> so I try, uh, and so that's why we tried to create this show in this way to give you some facts for some reasoned analysis that doesn't take off on flights of fancy, and then allow you to make your own decisions from that point on. So exactly. you don't have to share our opinion. But when we're going to tell you that something is a fact, it is a fact. We've researched it; we know it to be so. If we give you some analysis, uh, you know, we're not trying to shoehorn things into. No, no, no. Um, you know, we give credit when it's due, we throw brick bats when they are due, and uh, when we are wrong, because it we does happen, yeah. we uh, issue corrections on ourselves, <laughs> and we don't, we don't pretend it didn't happen, uh, because it does. We're going does. to make mistakes, we're only human. So, uh, we try you know. to, so we try to bring a media literacy, uh, social media literacy, media, uh, political literacy, civics uh, mm -hmm. aspect to it. Uh, and we uh, try to um, try to meet people where they're at, but we try not to underestimate the intelligence of our audience as right. we assume that our, our audience, we assume that you, if you are watching, are an intelligent person. Yes. Uh, and that you have the ability to reason and you know separate fact from fiction. Uh, and, and, and you have critical a, thinking skills and you want to learn new stuff because I'm shocked at the amount of people who oftentimes send me text messages or emails or DMs on Twitter who are like, well, thank you for that. I'm like, oh, you're, you're welcome. But it, it, I'm kind of like, what, you, you're just learning of this now? And, and the way my ADHD OCD brain works is like I just suck up all the information I can like a vacuum like a vacuum cleaner, it's like everything, I, I, I literally inhale information. So I have sometimes a difficult time when I'm trying to understand that somebody else doesn't do that too. And I'm like, oh wait, no, I'm, I'm the weirdo here. I'm the strange one. I, I'm the one with the bizarre th thought processes. So I, I oftentimes want to get a, a, a compliment or, or a critique or whatever the case may be. I'm like, oh uh, yeah, th thanks. You know, like, thanks, eh? Uh, and, and in my back of my mind, I'm like, how do you not? Oh, right. It's because I'm the weirdo. I'm the and, one who, who, who siphons up the information. And, and we come to, from the perspective that people are busy. Yes. People, people are very busy. You might now, have I, missed something. Well, and, and, and to that, sir, I thought I would show you something from our favorite media relations person. <laughs> oh, Sarah. No, 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 no. Uh, Pierre Polyev's media relations person, Sebastian Skamsky. Oh, Skamsky. Yeah, so I'm just going to show you. This is his page, right? Sebastian Skamsky, media relations for Pierre Polyev, proud conservative, foreign affairs and politics, golden retriever enthusiast, AirPod evangelist, agreeable contrarian, Canadian. He lives in Mississauga, or he's from Mississauga, I guess. I don't know. But let's scroll down to his, his uh, most recent tweet from 12 hours ago. The bought and paid for media is either dumb or dishonest to peddle Trudeau's latest housing, in quotations, announcement. They re regurgitate PMO talking points about promises he's been breaking for nine years. Remember, his promise to make housing affordable, in reality, he doubled housing costs. Okay, not only no. is this full of lies, bullshit, and, and incorrections, but it's, it's the first line. It's the very first line. The bought and paid for media. Let's scroll yep. down. And who is this from? Bloomberg News. An American corporation owned by Michael Bloomberg, a billionaire American. This is not written by a Canadian. Yeah. So this, this clown, who is the media relations guy for Pierre Polyev, is accusing Michael Bloomberg of being Canadian and bought and paid for by Justin Trudeau. Yeah. I can't make this shit up. Also, <laughs> housing is a provincial priority. Also, housing is a provincial responsibility, Correct. and the Prime Minister of Canada had to step in when our premiers, who are the actual problem, decided that they were going to abdicate the responsibility for doing their own job. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's like, uh, remember his promise to make housing more affordable? In reality, he doubled housing costs. Okay. How many times do I have to say this so people will understand it? I don't care who the Prime Minister of Canada is when it comes to housing costs. They have nothing to do with the price of housing, period. Mm -hmm. Never have, never will. No prime minister in history controls the price of housing. It's a free market economy when it comes to that. That's it. You don't like it? Capitalism at work. No, he didn't. 
No prime minister has ever had the power to control the price of housing in history of this nation. If you think they do, oh, I have some beautiful oceanfront property in northern Saskatchewan. I'll sell you for a really good price. Yep. 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 I mean, that's just how it is. But that's the example that we mentioned when we're talking about the, you know, the, the, Holo the Holocaust Day and all of that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oops. Mr. Grizzly, you were talking and your sound went off again. Oh, sorry. I think I just turned my head there. Don't worry about it. It's good. It's good. Okay. Um, or either you're on a time delay on my screen, one or the other. I think that's the um, case. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, you have to, um, uh, on, on this debate, uh, the, the housing one, you have to the, be very, very clear that, you know, this, the, the recent, you know, the government said that they would do what they can where there was the responsibility and they did it. They created some incentive programs and that type of stuff. But when it became very clear uh, that our provincial premiers were demanding uh, a lot more temporary foreign workers and uh, were demanding a lot of international students to uh, help fund our universities and colleges because our premiers decided that they were not going to fund it from the core budget. Uh, they asked for all these people to come here. Yes. Uh, the only exception is Quebec, who have, who's got more than half of the asylum seekers as well. They didn't ask for that. Right. But everywhere else, uh, it was the province that said, hey, we have a worker shortage. You need to bring these people in. We right. don't have enough Canadian-born students to be able to fund our colleges and universities. So you need to bring them in so we can raise some money. So, and that was literally a provincial government thing. Government gave the provinces what they wanted. Now things got out of balance. Yes, and now the federal government has taken action. There have been some changes to the temporary foreign worker program. There have been changes uh, to the a number of students that are being given student visas. Of course, this will probably take the better part of a year to work its way through the system. Uh, but uh, now, for example, uh, with regard to, to youth unemployment, the numbers are starting to rise. But you know, then again, we had X number of 10,000 people working in low-wage jobs as temporary foreign workers. We don't need them Correct. as more to create the room in those jobs uh, for Canadians uh, who want them, Canadian youth who want them. So uh, they're working on it. They're making adjustments. Right. Uh, Housing Minister Sean Fraser said on Sunday that the federal government will curb the number of temporary foreign workers coming into the country after a post-COVID surge that some research says have driven up youth immigrant unemployment rates. Speaking to reporters in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, before the start of the, la the retreat, Fraser justified the government's past decision made while he was immigration minister, so he's wearing it both ends, mm -hmm. to relax regulations around the temporary foreign program worker program as necessary at a time of pandemic-related staff shortages. And a lot of them was to bring in uh, healthcare workers as yes. well as personal dependents and all that kind of stuff. But he acknowledged that the dynamic is different now and there are signs of stress in the labor market. Quote, the landscape has changed. We don't see that acute labor shortage that exist, e existed even two years ago. As the economic landscape changes, so too must the policy landscape which makes sense. You should expect to see in the future additional changes that will ensure that the programs we put in place to help grow the Canadian labor force first and foremost, foremost create opportunities for Canadian workers. The minister said Canada can absorb the number of new permanent residents being added each year. The country will admit an expected 485,000 immigrants in 2024, but conceded that non-permanent immigration programs allowing foreign workers and students to come here on a short-term basis are putting stress on an already strained housing supply. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the document gives us a little bit of history, but we had mentioned it a bit. Uh, the agricultural sector has long relied on temporary foreign workers to grow and harvest the food the country eats and exports. Quote, we've seen such a significant increase despite the fact that we no longer have the labor shortage in existence to the degree it was two summers ago. That demands we take a different approach, said Fraser. The number of non-permanent residents has been growing at a breakneck speed in the post-COVID era after the federal government relaxed regulations around temporary foreign workers, especially in the low-wage stream, and allowed Canada's colleges and universities to dramatically expand the international student body, so like, like we said. In the last three years, the number of non-permanent residents, a category that included temporary foreign workers, international students, and asylum seekers, has more than doubled from about 1.3 million in 2021 to 2.8 million in the second quarter of this year. 
according to data compiled by Statistics Canada. Of that figure, 1.3 million people are in Canada on work permits, a category that includes temporary foreign workers. So as the permits expire, if they are not renewed, that will take care of nearly half of the issue right then and there. The low-wage temporary foreign worker sector, which has admitted workers in food services, but also sectors like construction and hospitals, has grown from 15,817 such workers in 2016 to 83,654 in 2023. That's a lot. That's at least a significant yeah. increase. Yes. The reason are so much higher than years past is that the federal government lifted a restriction in April 2022 that essentially forbade employers in high employment regions, those with an unemployment rate of 6% or higher, from hiring low-wage foreign workers in some occupations. Ottawa also increased the proportion of low-wage temporary foreign workers a company could employ from 10% to 20%, with a higher 30% limit for some industries like accommodations and food services. In March, the 30% limit was again reduced to 20%. As a result of the more lax regulations, there's been an uptick in businesses like Tim Hortons and convenience store chains, chains bringing in workers from abroad to fill supposed labor shortages, even in areas where the unemployment rate among locals is high. There's also been an increase in foreign workers getting entry-level office jobs. A recent United Nations report dubbed Canada's Temporary Foreign Workers Program, in which foreign workers are linked to a specific program for a set period of time, a breeding ground for modern slavery, and yeah, nobody yes. According to the Bank of Canada's recent monetary report, the newcomer or immigrant unemployment rate now stands at 11.6%, well above the overall unemployment rate of 6.4% that was recorded in June. Quote, the softening of the labor force market has made it even harder for newcomers to find a job and be attached to the labor force, said the bank. Notably, the unemployment rate of immigrant and Canadian-born black people is 11.9%, according to Statistics Canada. For youths, which include people between the ages of 15 and 24, the rate is higher at 13.5%, the highest it's been in a decade. Young Canadian workers are having an exceptionally tough summer, said Mike Moffat, the Senior Director of Policy at the Smart Prosperity Institute, a think tank based at the University of Ottawa. He pointed to Canada's labour force survey, which shows that the number of young people between 15 and 19 who worked last month was the second lowest on record, only slightly ahead of the pandemic lockdown year of 2020. Outside of 2020, when we were in lockdown, 2024 has been the worst year on record for teenagers to get a summer job, whether as a cashier or at a convenience store or selling ice cream, Moffat said in a recent post on the issue. Despite the challenges teenagers are currently having in the job market, the number of temporary foreign workers approved for those same positions has never been higher. And here I will make the uh, note that even though Mike Moffat is using the word lockdown, we did not have a lockdown. We had a shelter at home. Direct Correct. Not shelter in place, shelter at home, stay at home. Uh, nothing, no, again, nobody was locked down. Matter of fact, I know a number of businesses that actually uh, adjusted their, the way they did business. Restaurants, yeah. as an example, who suddenly created a whole takeout menu that they never had before. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and it kept them afloat. A uh, restaurant just a block away from me that I love to go to, the Elgin Street Diner, which opened, I think, in 19, is 92 or 93. I came, I was there the first week it opened because it was one of the, uh, one of two places that was open 24 hours on, well, it's, it's been open 24 hours a day since it opened. Yeah. Uh, the, the only other place that was open that late was uh, Mellow's in the market and that's gone. Yes. It doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, and, and, Mellow's. And, and Mellow's was not 24 seven, seven days. It wasn't 24 seven, right? It Just was on the, the weekends. Weekend. Yes. On the weekends, it was 24 hours. Whereas the Elgin Street Diner has been open 24 hours a day since day one. Yes. And for those of us who would finish a uh, shift at the bar, we wanted to go get something to eat afterwards. There wasn't a lot of places, you know, at, on a Thursday night or a Wednesday night, if I just finished and I want to go get something, they were open. During the pandemic, the doors were closed to customers dining in place. But the restaurant continued to serve food and the owner continued to pay his staff as if they had shifts. So if you were scheduled for a shift, you got paid for it and he paid them accordingly. And I heard him I, like, I know the owner and he had a conversation with somebody that he says, yeah, I, I, I was able to keep my doors open because we, we did a, a massive takeout menu and a lot of our servers actually delivered the food instead of going to, uh, you know, a, a, a corporation that, doesn't mm -hmm. on the regular 
His serving staff did it, as did uh, the lieutenant's pump, where we, you know, just had a pub cast. Their right. serving staff uh, was delivering food, right, and drinks because you were allowed to sell beer as well. So we we kept those folks operational, and I say we as those of us here in Centertown who just got tired of <laughs> cooking every single meal at home. And and one of the things I came to realize was I didn't know how many dishes I could make dirty. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Because when you're cooking th- three meals a day, seven days a week, it's like, I never stop doing dishes. <laughs> I know I'm not the only person who came to that realization because, you know, when, when you, when you are at work, you eat lunch at work, whether you prepared it yourself or you purchase it or whatever the case may be. But when you're at home all the time and, and myself, breakfast is a rare thing. It's like, this is usually my breakfast coffee, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, when I was home, I go, well, I'll just have some toast and, well, maybe some eggs and how about some pancakes? And and I did put on weight during yeah. COVID. The first the first um, uh, business shutdown, the, the two months yeah. I was home. Everybody, everybody was asking, asking everybody me put if on, I put on COVID-19. This was yeah. more like a COVID-26. <laughs> well, I did, I did put on 20 pounds, which I had nothing me, to do but cook and eat. <laughs> for me, that's an extreme... Like I can't put weight on, but when I was literally, there was nothing I could do. And they're like, well, you can stay in your bubbles. And so I'd, I'd go for a walk around the neighborhood. Then we started hanging out on my buddy's porch. You know, he had literally, there's normally three, three, uh, Muskoka chairs and then somebody else. But this, and during that time, there was like literally one in each corner, two chairs, and we'd sit out in the front yard and, and we just hung out just to keep each other from going crazy during that time period. And I, of course, the minute I went back to work, I lost the weight in like two days because I, my metabolism is stupid and I, I can't sit still for very long. Mm-hmm. And as you well know, I'm like basically the same shape I've been in since I was like 19 years of age. Right. I just, right. I don't, you know, so I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, I, I think we should wrap up soon, sir, but I just wanted yeah. to, I just wanted to highlight, where did it go? Oh, darn it. I lost it. There was something I had highlighted. Okay. And... You can find it because I got one more thing for the kits. Okay. So go can... ahead. Um, there was uh, an article, an opinion piece that appeared in the Toronto star that I wanted to read to you because um, I like the angle, I like the angle. Uh, it is a story that is titled uh, these Canadians don't care much about politics. Here's why a growing number feel democracy isn't working for them. This is by Raisa Patel. On the face of it, Anaf Zaheen and Taylor Stewart don't have much in common. Zaheen, who arrived in Canada from Bangladesh when he was a child, just turned 20 and is about to start his third year as a neuroscience and physiology major at the University of Toronto. Way to go, young man. Stewart is 37, grew up in Kamloops, BC, and is an air ambulance pilot in Vancouver. But although they don't know each other, each feels similarly about Canadian politics. They rarely pay attention to it, they don't follow the news coverage, and they feel that over the course of their lives, the people streaming through Parliament Hill haven't done a whole lot to make things better. Quote, I just have a sense that politics doesn't really affect me much or at all, said Stewart, who said he also doesn't feel particularly empowered by a system rife with toxicity and red tape. Zaheen, meanwhile, knows at some level that federal politics impacts real people, even if it's hard for him to see how those goals and machinations affect him. Quote, the easiest thing to do is just keep it to myself and not seek it out, he said. Stewart votes, and Zaheen thinks he probably will too, now that he's of age. Even so, they both can be considered politically apathetic, people who feel, for various reasons, uninterested in political and electoral affairs. Some may believe their vote never makes a difference, that the system isn't working for them, or that the issues are too complex to understand. In today's increasingly untamed information environment, others are repulsed by the way politicians attack each other, suspicious of or ensnared by misinformation, and becoming more disconnected due to low levels of trust in government and the media. Now, new polling and data shared exclusively with the Star shows that while people are generally satisfied with democracy, the number of Canadians who are not at all satisfied is higher than at any other point going back to 1997. Quote, the house is not necessarily on fire, but there's things we should be concerned about, said Abacus Data CEO David Colettle. Abacus's survey was conducted with 1,550 adults between July 31st to August 7th, Respondents were surveyed online, meaning the poll cannot be considered truly random. A comparable random sample of the same size would have a margin of error plus or minus 
Well, that cannot be wrong. Oh, sorry. Minus 2.489 percentage points, okay. not 2,489. I thought that was a comma, not a period. Sorry, kids. 19 times out of 20. The results were when the results were compared were possible to the Canadian election study, a large scale survey of Canadians that has been conducted each election year since the 1960s. These findings show that 54% of Canadians are satisfied with how democracy works in Canada, a drop from 72% in 2021. Mm. That is massive. Yeah, no kidding. That That's is massive. Huge. Nearly That's 20% humongous. drop in three years. Yes, but not far off from the 58% and 56% of Canadians who felt the same way in 2015 and 1997, respectively. So it seems that up until... Um, uh, vaccines became a thing i cannot that's too small for me on my screen i can't i can't oh, see what that I, is i think everybody else can see it. it's just the current temperature in ottawa it's 21 feels like 29 94 percent humidity it's it's um it's it's 10 o'clock in the morning and it's <laughs> it's already 30 degrees with the humidity basically huh. okay um mm -hmm. So basically, it seems that uh, trust in democracy was going very well up until 2021. I guess people were happy with serve and people were happy with the fact that we got vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but once uh, everybody sort of got their uh, first two shots, then uh, mm -hmm. people turned, okay, like, let, let's go back to life as usual. I've got my two shots and, um, well, yeah, there's sure. no such thing as life as usual after a pandemic. It's, it's, it's a different life. It's just a different life. Um, interest in politics has also increased since the 90s. 30% of Canadians said they were interested in political matters during the 1997 election. Those numbers haven't declined, with 56% of Canadians expressing interest during the 2021 race, and 57% of Canadians saying the same during the abacus survey. That is good. More Canadians interested in politics is good. Now, why are more inter Canadians interested in politics? Is it the convoy crowd? Maybe. I think so. Right? I don't know. Uh, with the, this uh, survey doesn't seem to have uh, uh, dug deep in the numbers to get that. Mm -hmm. Those are optimistic findings, Coletto said, given the prevailing opinion among the political set that everything seems to be, quote, falling apart. Nevertheless, most, res most respondents, regardless of age, gender, party affiliation, or voting history, felt that the government doesn't care what people like me think. That is not good. 68% agreed with that statement compared to 27% of respondents who disagreed. 58% of those surveyed felt like people like them had no say in what the government does compared to 38% who disagreed. Respondents had more split opinions on whether they struggled to discern what political information they were consuming was real and true or fake and untrue. And most disagreed that all federal parties were too similar to offer a real choice to voters. Mm -hmm. Good. 41% of respondents said they weren't satisfied with the way democracy works compared to 26% in 2021, 34% in 2015, and 40% in 1997. The size of the group who are not at all satisfied is worrying. I mean, that is millions of people, Coletto said. While 67% of people said they would definitely vote in the next election, 18% of respondents said that they may not vote, probably wouldn't vote or definitely wouldn't cast a ballot. The most popular reason among that group at 32% was a belief that their vote wouldn't change a thing. Quote, people don't always see politics as the best way to make a difference, said Nate Erskine-Smith, who has been a liberal MP since 2015, but won't be seeking re-election in his Toronto riding. Quote, I think it is incumbent on people like me and elected officials and those who care deeply about making a difference in politics to make the case to show people that everything in our lives is touched by politics, he added. Erskine Smith said that while he doesn't think interest levels have materially changed over the nearly ten, sorry, over the nearly ten years he's been in office, people do tire of incumbent government, governments, and he's witnessed a coarseness to the online discourse that didn't exist in 2015. That's one of the social forces Angus Bridgman, the director of McGill University and the University of Toronto's Media Ecosystem Observatory, focuses on in his research. Quote, I don't think in 100 years, when we look back on social media in the early 21st century, people will say that enriched democracy or democratic life and political participation, Bridgman said, of the explosive technology that, in its beginnings, had the opposite effect of boosting civic engagement among disenfranchised groups. Last December, researchers at the Media Ecosystem Observatory published a report based on sur a survey and social media data that found Canadians do not regularly consume political news, generally have low and decreasing levels of political 
political knowledge and have poor awareness of important political figures in Canada and the United States, which is one of the reasons we the show. Who relies upon that exclusively as their uh, platform, if you will? The leader of the loyal, the loyal leader of the opposition, or leader of the loyal opposition, I should say, uh, Pierre Polyev, and yes. the Conservative Party of Canada, the Reform Party. They love the low information voter. They love the low information voter. They want. What did Trump say? I love the uneducated. Right. Because they don't know. They don't know what's going on. And the reason we have a program is to inform as many Canadians as we possibly can. And not just Canadians. I mean, because we, we talk about other things around the world as well. So it's like, join the, join the damn fan. And we'll, you know, you're going to learn stuff. You're going to learn a lot about Canada if you're from another part of the world, for sure. You're going to learn a lot about our political system and how things operate here. But we will discuss things on an international level when we need to. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Researchers observed a significant decrease in political knowledge over the last five years and an increase in the use of social media for news content and noted that those who use social media for news tend to be less trusting of traditional media and are less likely to participate in politics. Quote, political news is out there, but it's not consumed by the vast majority of Canadians. They're just not actively seeking it out. Sahin, for example, does not follow any mainstream sources of political news on social media, but said he regularly comes across entertainment accounts which tend to distort or fabricate political content. While he was able to list the major federal political parties and their leaders, he was unsure whether the NDP's Jagmeet Singh was still at the helm of his party because he had come across some posts that erroneously claimed the leader had resigned. For Bridgman, this all distills down to one fundamental point. For those who believe democracy only survives on the basis of an informed population, that reality is withering away. Quote, if you do not have an informed population, then democratic elections don't work. Accountability and democratic politics don't work. None of it works. And you can have a political system that just glides by with a degree of corruption and intensitivity to population demands or desires, and that's fine, but it's not the type of democracy I want to have for Canada or that I think we are capable of having, Bridgman said, and I completely I totally agree with that statement. It's also not the vision outgoing Timmins James Bay MP Carl Charlie Angus has for the country. He says he's noticed a strange gap in political engagement, one that he thinks could be narrowed if Canadian politicians can successfully replicate the skyrocketing popularity of Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris in the United States. For now, Angus said he's picking up on plenty of insecurity on doorsteps from those who feel unsettled about the state of the world at a time when legitimate news sources are shuddering and political discourse is degenerating. Quote, people just don't want to be part of that. I don't blame them, said Angus, who pointed to Pierre Polyev's conservatives as one source of heated partisan rhetoric. The federal conservatives would not offer up an MP to be interviewed for the story. Gee, I wonder why. But provided a statement from MP James Bazan, who said the notion that Canadians are feeling apathetic is, quote, ridiculous, given their fervor for, quote, our message of hope because Trudeau has broken our country. People are coming to our rally, so there's no problem. <laughs> Uh, that's basically the conservative position we're leading now we don't see anything wrong with the level of engagement in politics and people's knowledge yeah funny how that works isn't it? we think that they're great it, it's just not serious on its face um, unlike Erskine Smith who says his young children are the reason for his departure the usually unflappable Angus said he was uncertain about running again because he's wary of courting new voters in his recently expanded writing quote before it was fun all the time meeting people at the doors is always fun we didn't have to agree but you could have great conversations now yes. you know ways he told the star so starting from scratch not knowing what it's going to be like <coughs> pardon me I've done this for 20 years I feel like I've done my share even though I'm sorry, got something in my throat. Even though I want to be really engaged politically and engaged in my region, I just didn't see Parliament as a place where I wanted to do that. So there you go, kids. There's some uh, data and statistics to let you know, uh, get a little sense of what's going on in Canadian politics and why it is that so many seem to be disengaged or why so many don't seem to know um, the most basic facts, like who's leading and which level of government is responsible for certain things, um, even whether certain leaders are still at the helm of their party. There you go. All right, Mr. Yeah, 
Yeah, we we do have a show. I just wanted to give yeah. a quick comment here from Mademoiselle Fox. She says, I'm a bit late to the chat. I've scooted home from Mr. Grizzly's after cleaning up and cleaning up my kitchen after a feast and singing on my porch with Paul, Douglas, and James. Yes, because we did have a sing song last night. We did. We did indeed. It was, good, like it, was a good, it was a good time. And I, again, apologies for sleeping. We were up pretty late last night, actually. That's that's actually extremely late for me. Yes. I'm usually like zonked out by 10, 30, 11. And last night, I, I don't even know what, what time it was I got home. It must have been after one, I think. It was late. Oh, close late. to two, actually. Oh, was it? Cl- oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's really late for me. So, yeah, it was between one and two. Yeah, because it had to be a little, yeah, before two, because I went back to to, to chat with James a little bit afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. So, yeah. Because I, I got in at around 2.20. Uh, did, did I give you your glasses? Yes, I got my glasses. Okay, I was like, <laughs> I, I'm from, a bit of a blur, a bit of a blur. Like, I, I'm not pretty sure I gave them to you. Yeah? Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Alrighty, well, let's wrap it up then, sir. All right, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. And thank you and welcome to uh, those who have joined us in, uh, on the chat with the Dam Fam mm-hmm. for the first time. Uh, hope that you got a good taste of it. Hope that you see um, that uh, while people have um, some strong opinions and are passionate about them, uh, that we can still have uh, respectful exchanges and dialogues. So um, there you go. Hopefully uh, that will continue and hopefully that you enjoyed it enough and that you, you found the content that we provide interesting and informative enough that you will want to come back. Uh, and like I said, you know, pull up a log, make yourself yeah. comfortable. Come on Just, in, you know, uh, and, and, and remember that you don't necessarily have to have every discussion during one show if you keep coming back, right? This, you know, so you you can uh, take time to develop stuff, and, and uh, you know, um, we love people who are uh, we love people who are active in the chat. Uh, the, that's great, um, because you know we see things and we we bring stuff up, and you remind us of things that uh, we want to talk about on the show when you chat as well. So we get a lot out of it too. We like to hear about your experiences and your thoughts because this is your show as well. Remember, sharing is caring. And word of mouth is priceless. And you've got the mouths from which we want the word to come. So tell your peeps and poops all about us. All right? It's very important. And if you would like to be sure that you do not miss an episode, well, you do not have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, who has sponsored our pod page. So I'm sure Mr. Grizzly will make the QR code appear. And that will bring you to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you go there and click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. You don't have to wait. You don't have to go looking for it. We deliver it to you because we like to help. Now, yes, we do. if you would like to help us in other ways, then you need to make like Kid Elaine and surf yourself on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page like 5,600 of you and a little more already have. Thank you so much. And there we have three buttons for you. Like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. They make us happy. And I know that you love to make us happy. Right? (laughs) And... If you would like to help us in yet other ways, the QR code that appears close to my head today, because for some reason I'm on top, <laughs> I, uh, we'll bring you touching that one at all. I'm not we're, saying it was a Pride Weekend reference. We're not touching <laughs> that one at all. I am no way. <laughs> I am <bottom. laughs> <laughs> that, oh, there you go. There we go. See, we you, you've just flipped me, Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> can't have so, anybody thinking that because that is simply not. Well, you know. You, you know. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So the QR code there will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find our tip chart course it costs us some money to put on the show so we ask for your help and your support and your encourage us to your encouragement to help us do more so if you've got a little bit of change some toonies and loonies uh, weighing you down and uh, you would like us to help you um 
take some of that weight off your feet, uh, then if you go to our coffee page and uh, drop them into our little piggy bank there, uh, that helps us produce the show, and uh, you have less jingling in your pockets. Everybody wins. Yes. So right. go ahead to that little thing right there. Some um, tipping. Little, you, can, there. you can chip in and you can help us uh, continue to pay for the show because it is expensive to do all of this. And I just added more lighting in. Uh, I think the halo is a little less than it was, right? Uh, I can't tell you. a little less. Over your head. Well, it's like if I shut off some lights, you'll see. Hang on. Watch this. Watch this. So I've got more shadows on me, and when I turn the lights on, a little less shadowy. Mm. Mm -hmm. A lot of lights. Mm -hmm. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven lights. I'm not kidding. Eleven lights in the studio. <laughs> yep. Lots of things going on. So, uh, yeah, kids and cubs. Uh, yeah, if you uh, support us there, we really do appreciate it. And of course, regularly, <clears throat> sorry, when you do, we do read uh, your, uh, we uh, do our appreciation and give you a big shout out on the show. So um, please, any, uh, help, any help that you can give uh, really means a lot to us. Now, if you're not able to support financially, please, that's totally not cool. a problem. Because the gift of your attention and the gift of your participation, when you make comments in the chat, when you send us story ideas, that's what matters most to us. So. We love to hear from you. Please write to us at truenorteagerbeaver at gmail.com, on our Twitter feed at trueeager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or right here if you're listening on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a place for comments there. Uh, we read everything. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Um, let's see. What else? Um, because democracy is something that you do. By-elections coming in on September 16th. If you're in Toronto, Ward 15, please remember, plan your vote. Make sure, uh, check your the voter rolls to make sure that you're still registered. Um, volunteer with uh, a candidate of your choice or with uh, your local electoral body because we need people at the polling stations making sure that elections run smoothly. So get involved in some way. Democracy is something that you do. It's not a spectator sport. So put your body in the game. And uh, who knows? Maybe even consider running for something. Right? As some of our kids have. You might be the change that you are waiting for. Right? Okay. From the Beaver Lodge. This is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? Yeah, get get the rest when your body tells you you need it, because I clearly did this morning by sleeping until almost 8.30. <laughs> Again, was up very late last night. Ooh. Abnormal for me to be up that late, and, and uh, I'm very tired today as a result, but that's okay. Hey, we got an extra long show today. I, I only joined for like, what, half of it? So, you yeah. know, thanks for hanging out and hanging in and hanging on. All right. Mr. Grizzly, I think it might be time to cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I, I got I got nothing. I got no Easter eggs at all. I'm I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around how that the, the, I got it over here on the YouTube and I'm like, I, we only see a part of the closing credits. It's very strange. I know. That's so weird. Like, well, <laughs> what is going on? I don't, I don't like this, but it, it's the thing. Once you start, if you start, if you go live in this, the only way to fix it is to end and restart. And I'm like, ah, we're already here. Let's just keep rolling. We're already here. All there. right. Then I'll have a, a couple of little things. Um, Canadians who make us proud. Um, 
some kudos to some tennis players, Carson Branstein, who won a tennis tournament, I believe, in Slovenia over the course of the weekend. Also, uh, we've mentioned them a lot over the last uh, few weeks, but uh, uh, Ariana Arseno and uh, Mia Kupres, who won uh, the doubles titles in uh, Granby and then got all the way to the semifinals at the, the Montreal 1000 tournament, uh, also won uh, the tournament in Saskatchewan. Uh, so there are... Um, they are they are doing really really well for themselves uh, yeah. coming out of nowhere. So uh, keep your your eyes on them. Uh, they uh, look like they're going to be a powerful um, doubles duo uh, for the long run. Their singles ranking is still not there yet. Um, but then again, I mean the performance at the Montreal Masters 1000 was just absolutely out of this world. So um, and they and they still do play singles. Uh, so uh, d don't don't worry about that. Uh, they're definitely there. And then uh, Kayla Cross also won a, uh, I believe, the singles tournament uh, in Saskatchewan, and it was an All Canada final. There, mm. so there you go. Uh, and I believe there was also a um, um, uh, Pan American volleyball tournament uh, for women, and Canada made it to the final against the United States, but uh, lost in the final. So, but uh, congratulations to our players there and i believe that's all i have for the moment i have one quick little take and then then i'm out um, all right i'm gonna put this on this and if you can't see oh. it because it's kind of tiny it's from fat girl hedonist that that's her that's her twitter handle she says i don't know who needs to hear this but i switched from buying coffee every day to making it at home two years ago and i'm still not in there and the response is, I have studied the habits of millionaires. While it is a good step to save money by making coffee at home, have you considered supplementing your income by committing massive fraud? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Kitlin M uh, uh, has a gentle correction for me. It was the Norsica final six for men, not women. Oh, okay, okay. Canada won the, the silver medal. Sorry. Yes, the women, uh, I believe, finished in uh, fifth or sixth place in their tournament. Okie dokie. All right. We'll see you uh, tomorrow.